Welcome to the October 9th, 2019 Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. If you could all rise and join me at the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do roll call, please. Cameron Shoot. Here. James Hebert. Here. Melinda Torrens. Here. Rudy Kieran. David Bork. Here. Chip Powell. Jennifer Waters. Here. Great. Thank you for being here this evening. This is a public proceeding, and unless the board specifically votes to go into an executive succession, the, pu the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and to view all the exhibits that are presented. So please notify the chairperson if you are unable to hear or to see any of the proceedings tonight. The board works from a prepared agenda and will take up tonight's items in the following order. First, we have an appeal for 6 Champion Street. Then we have an appeal for 5 Tasker Avenue. And third, we have an appeal for 370 Payne Road. Fourth appeal is 8 Arborview Lane. Fifth appeal is 14 Ward Street. Sixth appeal is 8 C Rose Lane. And the seventh appeal is 34 Power Horn Drive. Should be Powder Horn Drive. Powder. Thank you. Powder. That, makes, that sounds more familiar. In instances where the burden is upon the applicant to demonstrate the compliance with each of the criteria or provisions of the applicable appeal, the board will ask questions as necessary to understand the nature of the appeal as fully as possible. When all testimony has been heard, the chairman will close the record and the board will adopt finding of facts for each criteria of the appeal and vote to determine if the applicant has met the burden of proof necessary to meet the criteria. It is important to note that if, if any of the appeal or special exemption criteria has not been met, the board must de deny the appeal or the application. In many cases, the applicant or the landowner, landowner may have a personal problem, which prompts the request for this variance, but please understand this is not legally relevant to the applicant to the appeal. No matter how sympathetic the board is, we may be to the applicant's situation. After the board votes on the merits of each criteria, a motion must be made to approve the appeal, and if there is a second discussion, will follow. The board will then state conclusions of law based on the findings of facts to to support the decision on the motion. A general vote will then take place on the appeal. If the majority of the voting members present vote in the affirmative, the appeal is approved. If the majority of the voting members vote in the negative, the appeal is denied. The board's decision stands as of the date of the vote, regardless of the date of the written decision. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the superior court, except as otherwise provided by law within 45 days of our decision tonight. And again, we remind everyone that this is a public proceeding, and if you, ha you have the right to be heard and see what is happening tonight. All of the persons speaking will be asked to first state their name and address and affiliation, and all the board members and interesting parties are asked to direct all their questions through the chair, which is me. So first, we're going to approve the minutes from the September 11th, 2019 meeting. Did all the board members get a chance to review those minutes? Yes. Yes. Questions, concerns, or comments? No okay, do I have a motion to a motion approve? to approve the meeting minutes from Second. September 11th as written? Is there a second? Yeah. Yes. It's All yep. in favor? I it. <laughs> have the finding of facts from appeal number. 2666, which is a limited reduction of yard size for the property at 67 Jones Creek Ave. Did everyone get a chance to review the finding of facts and conclusions of law? Yes. Did anyone have any questions, concerns, or comments? I have no questions. Do I have a motion? I move to approve. I'll second. All in favor? tonight is we actually have six champion street who is coming back to present additional information in regards to just one of the criteria 
So I don't know if all of the board was present when you first presented back in, was it August? Was the first time? July. So all the board was present. We went through all the criteria. We voted on the, all the criteria. And the representatives and the appellant has asked to come back and readdress just the first qualification that we have for that. Um, Mr. Longstaff, I don't know if you have any additional comments from the town that you would like to give. Um, no. Uh, in your package, you received a letter from um, the appellant's attorney uh, who put forth some arguments um, in, in response to or in support of um, demonstrating that they've met the uh, no reasonable return criteria. Um, and also a letter from uh, Mr. Wilson um, on some uh, things that he wanted to clarify. Um, they were in your packets. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on them. I'm sure they will. And uh, as you said, we're just, we're, the board has already voted um, on three, well, actually voted on all four of the criteria. Um, it was tabled before the up and down vote was cast for uh, approval or denial of the appeal. So all we're really interested in hearing tonight is just the uh, supporting, uh, additional supporting arguments for the reasonable certain criteria. Correct, and we received a new submission from an attorney, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone in the board tonight has gotten a chance to review that memo that we received. Yes. Great. Yes. Um, Mr. Wilson. Yes, hi. Hello again. Uh, Walter Wilson from Design Company. Uh, with me tonight are members of the Fitzgerald family representing the Ch uh, Champion Realty Trust, along with Peggy McGee, uh, who is the uh, uh, going to do the legal interpretation of some of the questions that arose. And I got a few things I want to get into the record and clear up a little bit. Um, and it um, goes back to the last meeting, which was August 14th. Um, during the presentation, I explained how the project would meet and comply with the several overlaying districts that the town of Scarborough and other government agencies placed on the property. And this plan submitted a result of the criteria required to satisfy all the requirements. The proposal to replace the existing building is subject to the character uh, to the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, Section 12. And 12C3 states the project must meet the requirements of 15B unless this variance is granted under the appeals pursuant to 16G2. The proposed replacement building is intended to satisfy the standards of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. The existing building does not. The proposal is intended, is also intended to meet the requirements of DEP, FEMA, Frontal Dune, the Erosion Hazard Zone, as well as Scarborough's Floodplain Management Ordinance. The existing building does not. The proposed building satisfies the requirements of Section 12C for expansion. Uh, the proposed building satisfies the requirements of Section 12C2 for relocation. And the proposed building will still be within the 75-foot hat line. And that's the reason we've been here for this variance. The variance requirements of 6G are similar to the standard variance requirement for a hardship but do deviate in the direction the board should have in evaluating the application. The proposal meets the provisions of section 15, except the relocation is still within the hat zone. 16 G2 states the board shall grant a variance, shall not grant a variance unless it finds that the strict application of the terms of the ordinance would result in undue hardship. In 16 G2, paragraph D, of the variance has further direction to the board, which is not stated in the standard va hardship variance. The Board of Appeals shall limit any variances granted as strictly as possible in order to ensure conformance with the purposes and provisions of the ordinance to the greatest extent possible. So a strict application of the ordinance that says that the proposed relocation of the building does not meet the hat line setback would result in undue hardship. This would result in the existing non-conforming building having to be left as is. However, if the board were to recognize that the proposed relocation satisfies the requirements of Section 12C2 and that the hat line setback has been met to the greatest extent, 
the granting of the variance would ensure conformance with the proposed purposes and provisions of the ordinance to the greatest extent possible, as stated in paragraph D. Now, my presentation to the board has been directed to the requirements of 16G2 over the last couple of meetings of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. During the board's discussion of the proposal after my presentation at the last meeting, I became concerned that the board was utilizing the criteria of standard request instead of the criteria for a variance under 16G2, and that the board did not consider that the owner will sustain unusual difficulty and sustain financial hardship without a variance. That's why I asked to have the uh, um, request uh, the last time table. In addition, I'd like to remind the board, the project has received administrator approval from, by the Planning and Code Enforcement Department for the placement of the building, building, the building design, the size of expansion, and relocation as required in the CDCR1 district. And you can refer to the letter Brian Longstaff on March 26. In paragraph one of the letter, it states, given the uniqueness of the property and the fact that it doesn't have street frontage, staff accepts the 18 foot setback from what is essentially the rear property line. This provides spacing between this building and dwellings to the north. It also factors in the shoreland zoning setback and substandard lot size that prevents the dwelling from being located in any other manner. That was in the approval from the administrator review. A <coughs> um, couple more things I want to bring up. And it has to do with this um, relocation of the building. One area I want to expand on from my previous presentation is the proposed building placement on the property. The buildable area of the lot is 73 feet in depth as measured from the ocean side seawall to the rear lot line. That means that the entire lot was within the hat line <coughs> setback of 75 feet. The proposed replacement building is to be relocated back from the resource as far as possible. The front wall, ocean side of the replacement building, will be six feet further inland from, from the existing cottage and will have an open deck on the ocean side. The CDCR1 zone requirements for building in shoreland overlay, floodplain, and sand dune districts are outlined in Article 2, Sections A, B, and C. Within the 75 foot back from the resource, Article 3A says the building placement on the lot may not move or add to an existing structure any closer to the resource, as per Chapter 405C. That's the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. In the floodplain, which this is also in, Article 3B, building placement on the lot, is controlled by the character district, CDCR1, in the Shoreland Zoning. There are further notes in these two sections that refer to the um, provisions of the Chapter 405C of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, as well as referring it to the floodplain management ordinance and the DEP chapter 355 of the coastal sand dune rules. All these different agencies have different setbacks and so forth that you have to consider in relocating the building. In the, in the sand dunes, in the frontal dune, which this is also in, chapter 355 says you have to consult with the DEP for a location of the building. Also, we are in the erosion hazard area. That's controlled by the character district as well as chapter 355 of the NRPA and that's to consult with the DP for its location. In referring to the regulations stated above, if you look at them, you find in the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, section 12C1 defines expansion. A non-conformant structure may be added to or expanded if such addition or expansion does not increase the non-conformity of the structure. If any of the structure is less than required setback from the normal high water line, the structure shall not be expanded in floor area and volume by 30% or more. And we meet that class uh, restriction. Okay, Are we, we're, we're talking about just tonight, the reasonable return, right? Yeah, Okay. this all gets to it. 
Okay. Okay. The relocation under Section 12C2, a non-conforming structure may be relocated within the boundaries of a parcel on which the structure is located, provided that the site of the relocation conforms to all setback requirements to the greatest practical extent. Chapter 355 of the DEP in the frontal dune projects, uh, referring to reconstruction or replacement of buildings not severely damaged by wave action states, the building must be moved back from the beach to the extent practicable as determined by the department given setback requirements and site limitations. So they want it moved back as far as it can possibly be done. Now the relocation position is not determined by a measured distance, but is intended to be determined on an individual case based on the depth of the lot from the resource and the building set back lines that define the buildable area of the property. Indeed, CDCR1 zone allows for a building within the 75 foot setback to be expanded or replaced with a new structure. The NRPA chapter 355 is more restrictive and it states that the replacement building must be moved back as much as possible. In either case, the relocation could still be within the 75 foot setback if the lot depths, if the lot lacks the depths that would otherwise allow for a greater setback. As to the installation of the pilings under the replacement building, the requirements of, sec of the CDCR1 zone, the floodplain management ordinance, the erosion hazard area regulation, as well as the DEP chapter 355, all require the building to be supported on pilings. The staff review for this meeting questioned if the application might be eligible for a variance from B DEP pursuant to chapter 355, section 9 and they asked the DEP to look into that. As stated in the DEP response to the staff's inquiry, it says it has been extremely rare that an applicant has been granted a variance from 6G and would be extremely difficult to prove undue hardship or that there are no practical measures or alternatives that would allow the project to proceed in compliance with section 6, 6G. If the applicant is willing to comply, there is no hardship and there are practical measures that would allow the project to proceed in compliance with six, Section 6G. The design plans that we submitted to the board show that the project can meet the DEP requirements and that the applicant is willing to comply. Therefore, a variance would not be granted. The DEP response also states the standards for frontal doom projects, explaining that all buildings modified or reconstructed must have the lowest portion of the structural members of the lowest floor constructed on a post or piling foundation. The applicant is requesting that the board grants a variance request so that he can replace the existing non-conforming cottage with a building that complies with all the requirements of the various agencies and to relocate the building as shown on the site plan. And now I'd like to introduce Peggy McGeehy who will explain more on the hardship part in that first section of the variance request. Thank you. Well, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm Peggy McGeehy with the law firm of Perkins Thompson, and I'm here on behalf of Mike and Dan Fitzgerald. They're both here this evening, and, and if they could both speak a few minutes. Um, and uh, we are here to address the no reasonable return standard. Um, and I, I, it sounds as if you have the letter uh, that we submitted and its attachments. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to go over, touch the high points of that, and uh, I would like to address, um, uh, to a small ex extent, uh, Brian uh, Fikes, uh, Longstaff's um, uh, comments, um, and uh, then refer to a couple of things that uh, Mike will be saying. Uh, so the question uh, uh, is, is that standard for of unreasonable return met? And as I, my letter notes, uh, this board correctly referred to um, their, those cases where um, there's been vacant land and the, the law court has said that vacant land has value, you can recreate on it. There's no cost to you um, in keeping that land as it is. Um, 
so long as you can, there is, there is a case like this, you know, so long as you can have a, a, a trailer and, uh, and lawn chairs on your land, that's value. Now, there are also, of course, cases where if there is uh, no ability to build a house, uh, the boards have uh, found uh, that you can go ahead and build. So there are a number of cases with vacant land. There's no out-of-pocket cost, no damage uh, to uh, the landowner and having a variance denied. It's just they can't maximize their value. They can't improve on the value. And, and so that is one side of the coin. And what my letter uh, was uh, addressing was the other side of the coin. Because there is case law nationally, regionally, in Maine, uh, which says that if someone who has property, who has a structure on a property, and without the variance is going to sustain hardship, and by that would be, under the Maine Law Court, substantial financial hardship, unusual difficulty, for the no fault of their own, including with the unique circumstances, that meets your no reasonable return. And so where are the cases where the law court in Maine have found that? Well, there is a case, and rather than go into the citations and the names, you have them in the letter, but there's a case of the um, worn and tired nursing home. And the nursing home wanted to um, uh, go up to today's standards. Now, obviously, the nursing home has value. Just as we have a, 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 old, a worn and tired home here, this is a worn and tired nursing home, but they needed to have more parking, and they said, we can't get that parking. And the board said, that meets the standard of, un it would be unreasonable for you to have to conform to this parking requirement because you're not going to be able to maintain uh, uh, up-to-date standards and you cannot improve your nursing home. So that is a main law court decision. It says you can do this. That is the way you can look at the other side of the coin. Now there's another one. Uh, I, there was a, uh, an American Legion building. Now obviously the building has value. But the American Legion found it couldn't stay open in the building unless it got some rental revenue. And so it went to the Zoning Board of Appeals and said, uh, we, we need to uh, be able to have a renter and you have additional parking standards. We have no room for them. Can you give us a variance? And the board did. And the court said that cost of losing revenue and having to close that unusual difficulty, that financial difficulty, meets your undue hardship, no reasonable return standard. So those are two main court cases. You have, um, I believe that one that I mentioned about the American Legion, that was uh, Justice uh, Brennan, who handles a lot of our local cases and, uh, and is uh, relatively recent. Uh, so uh, there are others, um, and uh, I'm going to say that Brian Longstaff is right when those cases show the court affirmed the grant of a variance. It's not that the court said it was wrong of you to deny the variance. It said you, it, it was valid to grant it. There are cases I have, I, I looked, I couldn't find them in Maine, uh, but uh, I think it's because when they, uh, zoning boards find an unusual distress where you're going to lose your home, and we'd like to talk to, tonight about losing a home from a storm surge when you can't be above the storm line, the storm surge line. Um, that um, it is uh, appropriate to uh, grant the variance, and so the boards do grant variances. This board granted a variance to. Uh, uh, Mike and Dan's cousin, Leo, t two years ago. There are members of this board who unanimously found undue hardship for the same reason that it was, a, as, as Leo said, I believe you're here this evening. Here you are. Uh, he had a, a worn and tired building. And I told him, I'm not talking about me, we're talking about the building here, but a worn and tired building uh, that um, 
it needed to be renovated and put up on pilings because of the FEMA mapping and the, and the sea rise and storm surge. And this board accepted that, granted the variance, and so right next door, there is that home up on pilings. And so now his, his, his neighbor and cousin is saying, same building type building built around the same time, same old and worn, and same sea rise. Uh, only now, this board is looking carefully at what does the law court mean? What is, what is the proper interpretation of uh, undue hardship? And I just want to say to you, as Brian Longstaff said to you, the court will affirm a grant. And if you can grant this, you should. And why should you is because this uh, sea rise and storm surge is no joke. Uh, and you, are, you have, are at risk, as, as we all know about this, we're at risk of having Higgins Beach properties, one after the other, being damaged uh, by storm surges and floods. That's why FEMA is, going, is talking about reclassifying uh, it to the most dangerous level. Um, I'd like, um, so what we've done in this letter is uh, given you um, some attachments, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to uh, read some of the circled bits that I've uh, provided there. Uh, to show that this is a, a real uh, issue. Uh, this is not speculative. This is highly likely that over the next couple of decades, without going up on pilings, there's going to be a loss of a home, a substantial financial hardship. So with the uh, first attachment, we have of effective sea level rise in Maine. There was a report from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, that predicts at least six inches of sea level will rise by 2050 and extreme scenarios where it could rise by as much as two feet by 2050. And the same report says by you know, 80 years, that's some of our lifespans, it's gonna be one to eight feet of sea level rise. And what's particularly threatening to Maine is the storm surge, not just the rise, but the storm. Um, and so moving on to the attachment two, it says the sea level rise uh, change for Maine um, is more abrupt than we think. In 2010, Maine experienced the most erosion in 50 years, and the Gulf of Maine rose eight to 16 inches in just a few months. And the Gulf of Maine is much more susceptible to sea level rise because it's an enclosed basin. So it's rising faster than other places along the coast. I'm going to just skip a couple of these maps that you've seen um, about how uh, the, uh, the home is right there on uh, the shore. Um, and we all have experienced, I think, the tide coming in closer. Uh, year to year. Going to um, the third page, there is, because of where <coughs> this home is, um, it needs to have flood insurance. Um, and as the second page says here, those in the higher risk areas, which this is, the cost of coverage depends upon your size, construction, and also your elevation. It, why, it says it can, the um, average flood insurance policy costs can vary widely depending on your home's elevation. And it says, the primary way to reduce your flood insurance costs is increase your home's uh, elevation. Going from four feet below uh, the base, base flood elevation to three feet above can save $90,000 in 10 years. As, um, as Walt Wilson explained, and as his materials show, this home where it is now is below that base flood elevation. It doesn't qualify on any of the standards. It is in danger. That's not speculative. Uh, but based on these statistics and then turning to attachment five, you have pictures of storm battered coastal towns assessing damage. Now since 2017 when you granted um, his neighbor the variance, there was that storm that just battered the coast in 2018, and you have the photographs of, of the flooding. 
And if, if you went to walk down York Beach, you saw how it's sidewalks, I mean, so much devastation along that beach. Uh, it pushed high tides uh, two feet above predicted levels in Portland. And the Saco city manager said that the foundations of two homes at the end of uh, an avenue were ravaged by waves. 15 homes in Ferry Beach and Cap Ellis were damaged by flooding. And this is just last year. It was extensive in wells. The code enforcement officer had to con condemn a home. He said the water went right through the house. And then in Scarborough, I don't know what everyone's gone to the clam baked seafood restaurant, but it was entirely surrounded by ocean water. And to its credit, it's still opened on March 15th. So, and then finally, um, in the excerpt about uh, coastal damage, um, there was um, an expert who said that this storm was a graphic reminder of what is predicted to be an increasingly common phenomenon along the main coast. It is a picture of what we will experience in the future. And so I hope you looked at the photograph, kind of skipping some pictures, of, of these homes in Camp Ellis that are up on pilings. They're saving their community. Scarborough wants to save Higgins Beach if it can. And uh, Walt was talking with the Saco Town manager, asking about that. He said, we want the homes to be up in pilings. It saves the community. It saves tax revenue. When you have all those houses that are knocked down, you're not getting the revenue because they can't be built again once they're down in that final zone, zoom zone. So this is, um, we're, we're hoping to persuade you that you have the legal authority to do this and therefore you should do it for your community, for this family. Um, so I could go on and on with the things that are circled, but I hope that we've made the point. It's real. So if I could just do a little bit more on the legal authority um, and uh, then we would take questions. I gave you a couple of those main cases, but I want to let you know as well, and we have this in the letter, that this is a common way for the courts to address the, these kinds of expected damages that will come without a variance. Uh, it, I'm going to give one in New Hampshire, our neighbor state, uh, where in fact the court did overturn the denial of a variance. Um, because uh, the court, the New Hampshire court, and this is in a number of several cases they have, uh, the applicant was going to sustain an undue financial burden and stated that whether an area variance is required to avoid an undue financial burden on the land, uh, landowner to make this determination, um, that financial burden must be considered and therefore overturned the denial of the variance, sent it back to the board and said, you must consider what the financial burden will be if you deny the variance. Uh, and there are national treatises that all speak to when you look at undue hardship and when you look on no reasonable return, you need to look at whether it's going to hurt the landowner. Not just that they don't get value, they don't get you know, extra revenue, but whether it's going to hurt them if it's going to be denied. Now, if you just let me look at my notes for a minute, I may be done. I guess there is one point I do want to make. Um, the courts, when they look at uh, whether a board has properly granted or denied a variance, are going to look at the standard uh, uh, is in part error of law, but also whether um, the board is arbitrary. And there's got to have been variances granted by other zoning boards of appeal on these kinds of uh, CRI's concerns. Um, and this board itself, for such an identical situation, granted a variance two years ago with the same arguments, got to be above that FEMA line. And uh, we've got a, a, a worn out building and it needs to be reconstructed. 
And that was unanimous by this board. I'd love to clarify on that for a second, just kind of moving forward for, we do have somewhat of a new board here. And one of the differences is Mr. Wilson has come before us a lot of times. And what I think we like to see, and we, we have looked at everything, is evidence of this dilapidated building. So in 2017, we had pictures showing us what was wrong with this. The, the appeal that we're hearing tonight, and we have great new evidence, which we love, but I want to clarify, moving forward, and when we're looking at appeals like this, you know, we have someone who's saying the house is habitable, they're renting it, they're making it. So I want to clarify for our board, who maybe who wasn't here in 2017, that while she's saying it's similar, it was it was somewhat different, and we were provided more evidence at that time. Because I think right, it's important right, for right. them to understand that. And I never like to argue with the chair. Uh, I do no, like to argue with my children. It's, it's <laughs> good to clarify, because, I mean, you right. guys have done a good job at filling in the blank here. But I just right. want to clarify, in sure. moving forward, when people come before sure. us, if anyone who's watching tonight for a variance sure. appeal, we want to see this house and how dilapidated and how you have no return. Right. And, so and, um, and I, I, that, that's a, certainly a valid point that, that uh, was, um, I, I know, uh, information that was provided to the board two years ago. But I would like to make the point that it could be a brand new house. It could be spanking brand new and it's still below the flood line. It's, the storm surge is not going to spare a new house. It's still going to have that same damage. And so, for what we may be missing and providing you photographs of what's old and tired in the house, which we could have done, we're providing you perhaps a lot more information about the compelling uh, concerns about uh, storm surges and sea rise. Uh, but I uh, understand the point about you may have different facts, but whether or not the presentation was a little different, the facts are the same. It's the same old house. And you do have that, without having photographs, you do have that testimony, and you'll be hearing that from, from Mike and Dan, that this is an old house, I think 50, 80 years old. Um, so, uh, but I, under, I, I do think that's a valid point, that that's going to make it, if it makes a difference to the board, we can go ahead and provide additional photographs for you. But, yeah, uh, we, you know, uh, we just, we have a full bracket. So right. We've got seven right. appeals. We, we guys are here back to present on well, then, one criteria. Let then let me finish up with one that. sentence. I, I, I thank you for all this time. Um, and that is, as your planner has told you, you can do this. You can grant this variance. It is consistent with the law, and the court will uphold the grant. And in this kind of case, knowing that there's going to be other problems like this for other homes, you should do it. You should do it for this family and for the other families. And it's consistent with where you've been before. Um, and I will take questions if you have them. Thank you for your, all your attention. Uh, just, this is more of a statement than a question. <clears throat> uh, you, you have provided us with uh, case law uh, evidence w which we need to consider. We must consider this in making our decision. It's, it is new information. We didn't have this kind of information before. I just want to thank you for bringing that to us. Well, thank you. And if I may just say, um, this is an opportunity, I think, for us to be developing the law. I think that this is a kind of being on the cutting edge of, um, of trying to address a, a, a serious natural phenomenon. So we're learning together. I have a question for Ms. McGee, if you wouldn't mind. Um, first off, thank you for coming in and putting together a very uh, detailed packet. That's very much appreciated. My question is, um, do you know when FEMA will officially adopt the new floodplain elevations? You know, I, um, I had a college student uh, work for the summer. And I said, why don't you work on FEMA issues? And and uh, that's what she found is that even though FEMA has indicated that it was, wants to change this to the V category, um, that it's been getting pushback. And the reason why there's pushback by the local communities is once that V is put in place, you're in trouble. And so do I, can I predict what this federal government is going to do? I can't. I'm sorry. Uh, but it wasn't for lack of trying. No, for sure. And I guess follow up, following up on that, in the research that uh, the person you hired was going through this, how long has this been going on, the proposed FEMA floodplain elevation, for how many years? 
but still not a defined end when it's going to be adopted in sight. Yeah. Well, so I think one way that FEMA has been addressing this is it's saying, we think you should be V. And it's taking a while for our process to go through with all the hearings, but act as if you're V. And the insurance companies are acting as if you're V. And that's what they're saying. It says, and when you construct your homes, make sure you meet V standards. And so we may not be a duck, but we're supposed to walk and talk like a duck. I appreciate the analogy. Um, one comment, and as Madam Chair had mentioned previously, precedence doesn't count in this. I'm not going to comment on the previous board's interpretation of, of whatever happened a few years ago. Um, but I guess my concern is if what's rapidly changing with the sea level rise in the past few years, you know, couldn't you, uh, would you agree that there's a chance that the proposed flood elevations could change before they are adopted? And I guess I'll direct this question to Ms. McGee again. So as you know, um, the a proposal is to have the, this building lifted up to 18 feet, 11 inches, which will get it above that 18 foot line, which helps with insurance and it helps with, the reason why it helps with insurance is because it's likely to be safe in the, in the storms. Um, will the government want to increase it to 19 feet? I will tell you that uh, I just had a large project in Portland and the Portland planner said, I know what it says in terms of the standard, but I want you to go two feet above that. And we did. So I think everyone is acting as if, um, even though the government's a little slow, that we're, we're, they're all reacting to reality. I think it's the best I can do, sir. No, for sure, I, and I, I understand. I guess the concern is, you know, we go through the effort and the financial hardship of renovating this, of renovating this building to go up to 18 feet when this has been discussed for years already, another few years could go by and that could change again. So then if you are against, if it does change and it does increase another foot or two feet, then you're in the same position that you are today. That's true, yeah, that's true. Except for I would say that um, the V category is looking at more of the kind of the worst, the worst cases as opposed to the best case. <coughs> I mean, these are intended to be uh, safety standards, and the insurance industry is making sure that it's, the reason why it's 18 feet is because they don't want to be paying a lot of insurance for destroyed homes. And I guess why, uh, why uh, and understanding that the, there was a previous application, but um, why not wait until FEMA announces that they are going to adopt it within a certain period of time? Not waiting yeah. until they adopt it. Right. But when they say that by the end of a certain year or a certain date that they have set, why not then come before us and ask for that hardship where that piece of evidence is staring well, us all? And, right and so I would say if I, I had a home on Higgins Beach, I don't want to wait for the government. I'm looking at reality. I am looking at what happened to the 50 homes that have been, 38 homes that have been <coughs> lost in Camp Ellis, lost and to the homes that were lost and the sidewalks and the roads that were lost last year. And so it's, you can look with your own eyes at that. And if there is a storm, heaven forbid, if, if there's a storm in 2021 that uh, has terrible storm surges and they can be six feet above level for days, um, you will, the homeowner will say, I'm glad I did it now. And you will say, I'm glad I granted it now. So, I, it, and it's almost to me, uh, whether FEMA goes to V or not is irrelevant in terms of reality, except for when it's V, then the consequences about being able to protect your home are worse. And that's why you want to beat that clock. Okay, I have no further questions at this time. Yeah, let me say something. Oh. Yeah, about, about the FEMA maps. The FEMA maps have been out. Uh, the, we know what they're going to establish it at. They're up and down the whole coast. You can go online, get a FEMA map. And at Higgins Beach in this area, it's going to go to a VE elevation 15. Further down the beach, it goes to elevation 18. So the further you are down the beach, the higher that elevation is going to be. 
And that, that's all supposedly done with scientific studies and reasons. And they establish these things based on an anticipated 100-year study. So it doesn't mean that the flood's going to be elevation 15 next month. Down the road in the 100-year study, it says that's the elevation scientifically that they think is legitimate for now. You can't wait 100 years to design the building if you want to have it built. So you have to go by the information that's given you. And that's what we're being given. Um, so anyway, the FEMA elevation maps are out. They aren't hypothetical. They're there to look at. And in the AO zone, which this is, soon to become a V zone, in the DEP regulations, it says any structure in the AO zone should be designed to the characteristics of a V zone because the AO will become a V zone and you have to design to it now. So we're currently in an AO, it's going to be a V, it isn't a V, but in the A zone, you, AO zone, you still have to design for a V zone according to the TEP okay. information. All right. Does the board have any other questions? I have a couple. Yes, I'm please. Not specifically directed. Feel free to whoever is most comfortable to answer. Um, I apologize for tardiness. Well, speaking to photographic evidence, were there any photographs? I, uh, in my review of the application and additional information, uh, I didn't see anything specific to this site. No. No. Um, based on a previous discussion at a past meeting, um, there was some discussion about uh, recent inhabitants of the location. Um, would anyone feel free to comment about when it was last rented or inhabited um, long term? The owners did recognize that it had been rented out, yeah. okay? Most, how recently? Not all summer, I don't. I think middle of summer it was for a while, right? Yeah, like, uh, there's about uh, three weeks in July that it's rented out. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The um, flip side of the coin that Peggy was talking about doesn't have anything to do with the use that the building may have right now. It's that if it doesn't get brought up to standards, they will sustain a financial difficulty and a hardship which qualifies for unreasonable return that you're looking at on the board. So you have to look at both sides. Just because there's a building there does not mean that it's got reasonable return and you can't get a variance. You have to look at what the damage potential is to that building, regardless if it's a 50-year-old, 80-year-old, or a five-year-old building. If it doesn't meet the flood elevations and requirements by FEMA, it will sustain substantial difficulty and hardship. All right, thank you very much. Good evening, board. I'm Mike Fitzgerald, and Dan and I are co-trustees of the Champion Realty Trust. Um, we're here today, you know, with Leo Bruett that from from Four Champion Streets kind of helped us through this process. Um, you know, one of the big concerns, uh, you know, is the is the catastrophic damage that could be incurred or or getting the house wiped out. We also just had the property reassessed, taxes increase 56 percent you know f over 535 dollars a month uh, we have my mom lived in this property for several years stayed in may you know may through those that three or four week period in in july before august and um you, you know it's just been a you, you know it's been a tremendous uh experience for our whole family and you know something that we're determined to to pass along to our eight grandchildren or our or my my, my mom and dad's eight grandchildren our, our kids um and you know we're just we're just trying to get this thing you know protected going forward and and get it sustainable like i say it's it's been a loss i've i've run the books for five years now we lose money every year on it and and you know kind of subsidize it amongst ourselves right um, it's going to be a little more suffered. It is. It's a, a, exactly identical cottage to the Bruette built at the same time. You know, almost identical. You walked in, you weren't sure which cottage you were in. Um, my mom had this the the roof retiled or re you know re 
So we didn't, um, we didn't incur some of the water damage that I think you guys saw in the last photos of, of, of last year, but it's worn out. Our, our bathroom floor is sinking, it's, it's old. Um, you, you know, my mom was, was great, but you know, w watched every nickel, right? We got the same cabinets in there for 50 years. You know, one, one bathroom, um, you, you, you know, et cetera. So um, we just think it's, you know, it's, it's good for everybody, it's good for the, we're very much part of the Higgins Beach community down there. We think we, you know, we, we want to be here forever, really. We want our kids to pass it along to their kids and, and just really hope we get, you know, get, get the opportunity to do that and appreciate everybody's time and consideration. I'll let Dan talk to you. Okay. Uh, good evening and thank you for giving us this time. Um, I did have some prepared remarks, but I think it's, and you've said it a few times, um, that we got to address the hardship. And I think with the new evaluation of the home, uh, increasing $533 a month, plus the prospect of the 10 times or tenfold increase in the flood insurance, the way the building sits today, the way it's constituted and the rent we can get from that building will not even come close to breaking even or that break even point or us having to pay a little bit. I think the hardship is coming as those numbers increase and our insurance numbers increase. And, and as Michael just talked about, um, we have, there's four of us of our generation. We have, how many, Mike, three, eight, eight grandkids. Everybody enjoys our time at the beach. And, and I think to put the personal touch on it, uh, in August, first week of August, there are um, six families that come up for the week. There are over 80 people that come up from the week from all over the country. We call it Big Week. Um, and it's something that our parents, Leo's parents, our parents, when they purchased the home in the early 70s or so, um, they dreamed of passing along that legacy of us having to be able to gather for that first week of August with all the cousins and all the kids together um, as stewards of the property today, as we stand in front of you, we hope to pass that along. Um, we're hoping this process might be a little easier, but we understand there are some circumstances and what have you. Hardship today, you could argue that, that our bills are going up significantly and our rent cannot go up significantly. So the hardship's gonna be who can afford it? Can my sister afford to pony the bill up? Okay, now the burden goes to somebody else. So the hardship is there, regardless of the FEMA rule and uh, when that's adopted. Um, we just look for a reasonable opportunity to continue uh, what has become our family tradition for over 60 years now uh, at Higgins Beach, but coming to Maine and the generations with us and after us. So I certainly appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the public at this time. Is there anyone here tonight that would like to speak in regards to this appeal? Did we receive any letters or phone calls? We did not. I'm going to close the public hearing. Now the board is going to strictly just discuss the first criteria, and that is that the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. And we presented a lot of new information tonight. We've heard testimony. We've received evidence in regards to kind of what's coming down the road. And I think the difference between this board is we were looking at the current condition and yes, you know, you did testify that you have it rented and you are occupying it, but you're talking about the reasonable return that you want to have looking forward. You've made a very good argument tonight as to why this needs to be done now and why your reasonable return will be impacted in the future. Um, I don't know, Mr. Hebert? I guess, I mean, at this point, the way I'm looking at this, um, and as, as Ms. McGee had mentioned at the very beginning, and as our town attorneys have advised us as well, as long as you own it, you could have a trailer, you could have a camping tent, that is a reasonable return. And in the ordinance, it says reasonable return, not maximum return. Um, I think it's a point that everybody should just keep in mind as well. I keep hearing worn and tired building as well, but if we recall from the previous meeting where this was discussed, and I think in August, we heard structurally sound, and that they were renting it at that time. Those were in the minutes, and that was on the recording. Um, 
So that's another point that I want to keep in mind as well. Um, there wasn't, if it came before, if this became, if this came before us on a date when we knew when these FEMA rules were going to be actually adopted, that would be different. However, we've been talking about this for every year that I've been on this board about the FEMA flood rules and what they're going to be adopting, but they haven't happened yet, and that could change. And that's my concern, is that you have, you go through the effort and the countless hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a new home here, to then have it below a flood line that FEMA then changes in three years because of another major event. Those are just my, these are my, these are my thoughts on this, and that's my interpretation of what I've been seeing so far. That's not the same as the rest of you. Everybody else has their own opinion that everyone's looking at and their own information. Uh, it does not have to be unanimous or anything like that. Everyone's entitled to their own interpretation and opinion of whether or not this requirement's been met. Um, but those are my thoughts, and I would welcome any other thoughts from board members at this point. Mr. Bork? Uh, thank you. I, I will remind the uh, rest of the board of my initial comments when this first came up. And I just totally disagree with that argument. And I think that the case law that's been presented to us tonight is, 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 needs to be taken into consideration because it documents other cases similar to this that have gone before the Superior Court. And the, and the Superior Court has, has upheld rulings by boards uh, in favor of showing that uh, that financial dif uh, difficulty based on, you know, loss of use, insurance costs, which are dramatically escalating, uh, storm surge risk, you know, and that's whether FEMA changes now or whenever, it doesn't matter. I mean, we know storm surge is a problem all up and down the East Coast. These are real risks and losses. Uh, you know, I'm not saying potential in this case. I mean, we, there are documented losses, okay? Uh, so I think the courts have ruled that, you know, these kinds of potential losses do have bearing and must be considered. Uh, it's, so it's not just a vacant piece of land. It's not, okay? There's a building there. That building is, at, is under high risk. You know, look at the photographs that have been presented tonight and all the things you've seen yourselves in the papers and, on TV and everything. It's, it's not a joke. It's going to happen sooner or later. And a good just reminder a is when. these court cases come when neighbors not, and I'm abutters not are not happy. We don't have any abutters. We don't have anyone here contesting this with, yeah, with but, concern. But I'm not done. Like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so my final point is that all loss factor uh, is, a, is something that must be considered. In, in looking at reasonable return. Loss is, a, is the flip side of the coin, as, as Ms. McGee so well pointed out to us. And that was my position right from the beginning, and I'm sticking to it. Ms. Torrance. So when I look at this, I have, to, I have to ask myself a couple things about what the definition of reasonable return is. And I think there's a point at some place along the continuum of maximum return and no return at all that is reasonable return. Mm -hmm. And reasonable return being what, is, what has been customary and what has been expected and what is anticipated with proper maintenance and with, with the appropriate care to a property. Um, I, th I think an owner should be able to expect continued enjoyment of the property. A couple things about 100-year floodplains that I think sometimes people fail to really think about is that that doesn't mean that once every 100 years there's a flood. It means that the average is that during a 100-year period there is likely to be a flood. And that could happen in year one, it could happen in year 50, it could happen in year 99. And I think we can't, I, I think we've got to be very careful about how we evaluate what the likelihood is that something catastrophic could happen to this property. 
Um, last time I checked, storms didn't actually discriminate and say, you know what, we're going to wait until it's a, it's a, uh, it's moved up to Category V. Um, I, what I'm seeing before us really at this point is, is an owner applicant who's willing and able to take on the economic fiscal responsibility and put the effort into upgrading this property to a level that it's more likely to sustain any kind of, you know, catastrophic weather. Um, and I think that's a, a good thing that we shouldn't discourage. I, I think that when, when an owner is, is ready to take on the financial responsibility of upgrading and improving a property and making it more compliant with the recommendations, uh, we should take that seriously because there are other properties around them that are impacted. Should that, should that property get whacked with a big rogue wave and you know, parts of that property are drifting into another house and things like that, it, this, this is the stuff that happens. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, um, I, I think this is a very reasonable thing to say that, that in order to expect a reasonable return, you know, and enjoy continued enjoyment of the property, um, now is a good time, is as good a time as any to make the improvements. And if they're willing to do so at this point and be proactive, I think we should let that happen because in my, from my point of view, I don't want to be the one that's responsible for saying you couldn't do the improvements that were going to protect this property and therefore you lost the property. That's my opinion. So I, I can respect that any board member might, might have a, a, a difference of opinion on that, but I would prefer to err on the cautious side of saying, you know, should something happen to this property, I don't want to be the one that voted against them being able to move forward with making the recommended improvements of, of raising the property to a level where it was able to sustain possible uh, weather problems. I certainly understand both sides of this argument. I do not think that the concept of these storm events um, is anything to be argued. It's, as was presented, um, something that we have to accept and work with. Um, but I'm not here to change any circumstances that um, are imposed beyond this uh, my responsibilities here tonight. Um, I've heard that based on a previous meeting and tonight that most recently as of July or perhaps the beginning of August that the site has been um, successfully occupied and with that there has been some enjoyment um, of the property. Thank you. Could I add one more sure. thing that I did miss in my notes? Yeah. Um, one thing I failed to mention that is I really think that the current condition of the property is irrelevant. It, it, it really is irrelevant because what we're, ta we're not talking about whether something is, is looking pristine and, and, and is, is beautiful now. We're talking about preserving structural integrity and that is not the same as what is more likely cosmetic or cosmetic and structural. You know, we're talking about raising up a, an, an adequate building now and preserving it. Right. Ms. Waters? I'm wondering how we could define maximum return and I'm looking at the plans and you gain 900 square feet with the new build and um, you come very close to the maximum buildable plot. Uh, the maximum is 1,949 square feet and the proposed is 1,948. So I'm thinking that is the maximum return 
um, if you could define it, it's the maximum perhaps you could build this build out to. Um, so on one level, I think perhaps it's not reasonable to construct a cottage so large in the place of something that's in such great harm. Um, perhaps it would be reasonable to reconstruct the cottage in the same floor plan, um, the same existing square feet to really get the cottage out of harm's way. Because I do um, think there is a, a real, uh, true hardship uh, to be running into with the storm surges. It's real, it's anticipated, um, but I'm not so sure that what we're looking at here is an, a maximum return. Uh, yeah, I, I heard saying once uh, that water always wins, and I think that that's certainly what we should all be thinking about here. There's nothing to stop it. Thanks. If water hits the structure, it's going to cause chaos all around it. And I, can I add one more thing too? Mm -hmm. I, th I think to, to go back to your point of maximum return, um, the maximum allowable addition of space is the 30% rule, all right? But that's, that's not saying, that's already a compromise of that, you know, we could just build another whole level to this thing. We could keep going until we get to the boundaries of the lot. There's already, this is a shoreland zoning issue that has already said this is the maximum you can build out, but that's not the maximum that you could actually physically fit on the property. It's, it's actually a restriction that's already imposed to try to, minim to balance that. So I'm not sure if that's something you were familiar with. Okay. So again, we're just addressing one criteria today. The applicant owns a non-conforming .12 acre lot in the CDCR district that, is several, that we have discussed is, is subject, subject to several restrictive overlays that include the shoreland, special flood hazard zone, frontal dune, erosion hazard area, and the existing structure is non-conforming with regards to the side and shoreland setbacks. You've presented tonight, you want to increase the living space, and as Ms. Torrance just discussed, within the allowable 30%, which the town and every the state has limited you to. The footprint cannot be expanded due to the small size lot size, so this is what you're dealing with. And the preliminary FEMA maps place this property in a V15 special flood area, as we have discussed thoroughly tonight. Um, which, which prohibits the replacement of an existing structure. You know, we cannot predict when the maps will be effective, but the 2017 preliminary FEMA maps were enacted today. The building could never be voluntarily replaced, making the lot essentially unbuildable. The dune regulations allow for a vertical expansion of the dwelling. And if the lowest floor is constructed on a post or piling foundation, the existing structure sits on a concrete blocked crawl space foundation. Therefore, a new and different foundation must be installed in order to construct a vertical expansion of the existing structure, which would also make it compliant with the floodplain management ordinance. It looks like the proposed finished floor will be an ele at an elevation of 11, 18 feet, 11 inches, which will meet the floodplain management requirements. We've received additional information and testimony tonight in regards to reasonable return. I personally appreciate the testimony that was given in regards to what you guys have reasonably received in return until now. What you've presented tonight was that you had it rented. You, your house is now getting dilapidated. You're not gonna keep fixing it up. You, you, know, you can only make so much renting it. Your insurance is increasing. You want to maintain the reasonable return that you have always had on this property. And that is one of the things that you're trying to do tonight, is to maintain that reasonable return and not become and stuck in a situation where you can no longer build or you're dealing with a house that has been completely wiped out. The board has already discussed all the other criteria. We have voted on them. We have decided that you met all the other criteria. So what the board is going to do at this time is we are going to vote as a whole on one on the, the whole appeal. So at this time, I'm going to put to the board 
if we have a motion to approve variance number 2662 in regards to 6 Champion Street for a variance appeal. All in favor? That's three and those against. That's two. We pass. Thank you. You're welcome. here we've got a lot and we would really love to get everyone in tonight I think as you saw in our agenda we do not take up appeals after 1030 I am hoping we are not here till 1030 guys <laughs> so next we have an appeal for five Tasker Avenue and I will ask mr. Longstaff to give us a little background first um, yes this is a uh, this is a uh, Practical difficulty variance appeal um, originally came to us as a limited reduction of yard size appeal. Um, the lot coverage, however, is going to increase uh, from 24% to 31%, um, which exceeds the 25% maximum building coverage, and that's why it's now a practical difficulty variance, uh, although the setback requests do meet the limited reduction uh, limitations. Um, it's a 370 square foot deck. This being proposed uh, 10 feet from the rear or west um, and north side property lines, uh, which is a five foot variance, and 13 feet from the south side variance, uh, south side property line, which is a two foot variance. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions, and I've got the honor this evening to be able to represent uh, Ms. Gina Magauda and her family. Regarding her request, as Brian stated, for a, a relatively small deck that would go off the back of this property um, in the interest of brevity so that we can continue to move along. I think this is a little bit simpler, but nevertheless, um, would like to be able to give uh, just a very brief background and then um, go into the reasons for the request and then certainly entertain any questions or address any comments that you may have. Um, this property is located at Pine Point. Um, it's uh, uh, in the area where there are quite a number of lots and houses that are very similar in size. It's a relatively small house on a very small lot. Um, I uh, point to the uh, photograph, the aerial photograph in your packet to see, get a spatial idea of uh, what the house and the property looks like relative to the other houses there. You'll see that many of the, uh, mo probably most of us here in uh, Scarborough understand that uh, many of the houses at uh, Higgins Beach and at Pine Point are rather, or many of the lots rather are fairly small. Uh, this one at Pine Point certainly included in that. The house was actually built in 1930, uh, so it certainly uh, predated zoning by quite a number of decades. Ms. McGowda's family has actually owned the property uh, since 1960. Uh, she actually grew up there, and uh, she recently was um, uh, took over the house from her uh, mother, who just died uh, this past year, um, and she actually, through probate, just uh, took possession of the house uh, this past spring. One of the things that uh, has been going on with her family is that uh, while her mother lived in the house uh, as a principal residence um, ever since they, uh, they actually purchased it, there are members, other members of the family who would come up primarily during the summertime uh, and take advantage of this. Uh, the reason I bring that up is that uh, it's a, it was a challenge for Ms. McGowda and her sister, uh, who are now the, uh, the recipients of the, of the house, to uh, convince mom to do anything uh, toward the back of the, of the property. Uh, there was also a financial consideration, and while mom was alive, it just it didn't really go anywhere. Um, when the mother was deceased, um, Ms. McGowder and her sister decided that for the rest of the family, they would like to be able to put a deck off the back. Heretofore, a deck did not exist there. Uh, there was a small landing with the door out the back that led to the back area. Uh, the issue with the back area, however, is that, and you may notice this on your plans, there's an overall depression uh, in the back I'll call your attention to one of the photographs that uh, um, shows the well, a portion of the abutting lot is actually held up by uh, the uh, uh, lot area there is held up by a retaining wall, and uh, this whole section of the back property is considerably lower than uh, almost all the property, including the roads that are around it. The reason I bring that up is that um, when Ms. McGowda first brought this to our attention with a deck that had been uh, uh, or started to be constructed without a permit. 
um, one of the things that we said was, well, that's not going to really help a whole lot, so let's see what we can do toward that end. Why do you need a deck that's the size that you've got, real, real, even before we get to the permit? This is a pretty substantial deck. Um, why would you need that? And she said, well, I just wanted something to be able to have the, the family, including uh, two of her aunts and uh, one of the aunt's uh, sibling or one of the aunt's uh, children, all of whom are handicapped. That in and of itself doesn't mean anything, but from a family perspective, uh, it is a little bit of a challenge. Um, so what they wanted to do was to be able to uh, utilize a portion of the back of the property um, at the rear of the house. And toward that end, because of this depression, there was really no way to be able to even put a patio in that area. Uh, that's what we had asked initially when they first came to us, saying this is what we'd like to do, and said, well, you've got an access, why don't you just put a patio down there? Patio, deck, it can all work. The issue, however, is that this depression of property, when it rains more than about a two-year storm event, this is where all the water from this entire micro watershed ends up going into the back of this property. It's not just this property, it goes beyond the, the rear of the lot just a little bit, and then also a little bit more toward uh, King Street. But uh, the point being is that because it's a very low elevation in the Pine Point area anyway, particularly at high tide, there's pressure against the stormwater, and when you do get a two-year or greater event from a modeling perspective, uh, it basically fills up with water. Pine Point's all sand, but because of the high water table, that, that stormwater's got nowhere to go. So they have a veritable pond in their backyard, so they can't really use that very well. Um, it's particularly damaging in the, and literally damaging in the springtime with the thaws where it starts thawing and freezing and thawing and freezing. They get a huge, I, huge ice block back there, which basically negates their ability to be able to use anything as far as part that house is concerned from essentially the, the late autumn or so until uh, almost the early summer, hence the reason for the deck. She did not actually intend for the deck to be the original size that it was ended up, ended up being built. She actually met with Brian. She came to uh, Scarborough. She now lives in, in Connecticut. But um, she came and met with Brian earlier in the springtime. And Brian very correctly told her, this is what you need to do. If you want a deck, here's the process. She said, OK, fine. Um, and she went to try to find a builder. Well, she wasn't quite aware, as many of us are, that trying to find a builder in Maine is a little bit of a challenge if you're looking to do something fairly quickly. She was under the impression that she could get a deck permitted uh, and built within about two months and have the family enjoy it during the summertime. That didn't happen. It wasn't going to happen even if she did get her approvals. So um, she ended up uh, looking for builders, couldn't find one. Uh, so she went to a family acquaintance who's a handyman. Um, and essentially said, uh, we've got a sketch, uh, we've got a, uh, a deck, an area that I would like you to build. And the handyman said, yep, know the family, I can go ahead and do that, take me a few days. She's like, great. Um, this was divorced from, from Scarborough. She was doing this from, from Connecticut. So it then turned it, so he started and he got to where you see in these photographs. So the deck wasn't actually constructed, but the posts were in and the horizontal structure was, was built. Then it became fairly apparent. It's not hidden from anywhere. You can see from that photograph as well that you can see this area from the road. One of the abutters, by the way, is the is, uh, town of Scarborough, it's the fire department. Um, and uh, Brian became aware of it and rightfully said, wait a minute, there's no permit for this deck. I talked to you about this a couple of months ago. Um, you can't do this, there's a stop work order. When I spoke with it and she called us, and she queried Brian a bit and then said, uh, okay, um, called us and said, what can you do to help me here? This is when we started asking the questions about the, the patio, et cetera. And uh, our answer basically was, well, we can try to help you, but this deck is way, way, way too large. And she, she admitted, she said, it's a lot larger than I thought it was going to be. I don't need a deck that big. The, the way it was going to be constructed here was about half the size of the entire structure. Um, so I explained to her a little bit about what limited reduction means. Uh, that the area of the building envelope in the back of the house, and I would uh, um, direct your attention to the plan, is very, very limited. Because this house was built in 1930 um, at what was almost the back of the lot, there's actually an extra nine foot by the width of the house um, property that was added to this property after the original lot was created. So when the, when the house that you see there, uh, which is, by the way, older but structurally sound, uh, when it was constructed, it was done so at the very back end or toward the back end of the property. So. Um, there's not a whole lot of, uh, of area to be able to do anything else with as far as the deck is concerned, but we did explain to her that Scarborough is somewhat unique as far as its limited reduction of setbacks is concerned, and uh, it's a bit easier to deal with that as far as variances are concerned 
Uh, but then there's also the lot coverage issue, which Brian brought up as well. So um, as he mentioned earlier, the deck dimensions, which we then suggested that she adhere to, uh, would fit or would um, adhere to the limited reduction were it not for the actual uh, lot coverage, which goes from 24% right now with the house on the lot coverage to if the deck is approved and built in the configuration that you see it as proposed, um, it would go up to approximately 31%. So we're looking at just about a 6% uh, increase over the actual uh, lot coverage, which is not particularly an issue given the size of the lots in that area. You'll see also from the photographs and the aerial photographs that there are quite a number of lots that are somewhat similar to this. Um, this is one of the smaller homes in that area, and most of these houses do have decks, but they also have larger lots in many cases. Um, so carrying forward, um, she told her handyman when she was informed about the, the stop work order, she said, well, well, what was done as far as the permit is concerned? He said, I didn't file a permit. And she said, okay, that explains a fair amount. Um, so what we need to do now, um, as she was told by staff, is you need to remove what's there. She said, okay. So she spoke to her handyman, who was a friend of hers, and said, okay, you need to take this down. We need to apply for that permit, and then we can rebuild it. And he said, I don't have time for this. Nice guy, but he just said, this is not going anywhere as far as I'm concerned. You need to have another, get another builder involved. So this is where she was kind of back to square one, having gone through the cycles. Um, and uh, she asked my advice, and I said, well, you can't do anything further, period, end of story. Let's go ahead and reduce the deck substantially to the point where it is still reasonable as far as what you want to utilize it for, but it's not huge. Uh, there is also a door, that uh, the only door in the back that empties out into this property, or into the, uh, the backyard, uh, is a five-foot wide door that was specifically made to accommodate the wheelchair access. Um, we are looking at the deck, that the proposed deck that you see right now, along with the small landing uh, on which the door opens up, that would allow the wheelchairs to, with a small wooden ramp to be able to come out on that deck, not this one that you see before you right now, but one that would extend just past the end of, edge of the chimney, um, being able to move, maneuver then back into the deck per se. It's not particularly large, but it's big enough to accommodate several people. That's really the bottom line. We have looked at just about everything else that we could do to be able to make this practical. And uh, I think the size of the deck has been reduced substantially to the point where it is now practical. And toward that end, I'd love to be able to answer any questions or address any comments that you may have with our request to be able to receive approval toward that end this evening. Thank you. Does the board have any questions before we jump into the criteria? I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is this house ever rented out? No, it's, a, uh, it's all in the family. The, uh, um, Ms. McGowda Sr., Mrs. McGowda, um, only died about less than a year ago, um, and that was her principal residence. So they have not, that's not to say that they might not in the future, but right now it's only family, and it was, family was up there this summer, but it was not rented to anyone. Okay, so, and how many months a year uh, is the family there? Uh, well, notwithstanding the fact that the, the Ms. McGowda, uh, Mrs. McGowda had lived there all the way up until November of last year, um, it's not really a winter, a, a season, or it's a year-round house, but most of the people, uh, the owners and the family members are not there in the wintertime. Several do live in the, uh, the greater Portland area, but, uh, and they may visit the house, but they don't live there. It's primarily a summer activity residence now. So it's primarily a summer house? Primarily. For family? Yes. Okay. And not rented? Uh, it has not been rented thus far, no. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Question. Yes. Yes, the, the level of the, floor, of the finished floor needs to come out. It's actually, the deck would be one step lower than the finished floor and would have a, about a two foot long ramp for, to accommodate the, uh, uh, the wheelchairs that are coming out of there. By the way, I should uh, mention as well, one of the issues as far as, uh, and again, I know that this is not a, a singular criteria, but as far as the handicap access here, you'll note on the plan as well that the, uh, there is a side entrance to the, war, to the, uh, the house. That side entrance has a small patio, a brick laid patio, um, dry stack there. A portion of that patio is actually off of the property line. The only reason that that's done is that, you'll, and you'll see from another one of your photographs, is that that's the entrance that's used for these uh, handicap ramps to be able to get the people, uh, the three people who do live there uh, that are confined to wheelchairs up into the house. Uh, the front step is not really conducive to doing that. The reason that Mrs. McGowda, before she passed away, um, had put this brick patio there was to accommodate uh, her two sisters and her nephew to be able to access the property. 
Um, so there's really no place for these people to go once they get into the house other than coming down this section and just kind of sitting on this, uh, unless they're being wheeled throughout the neighborhood, literally sitting on this patio. This patio isn't necessary um, if we can get an actual deck. And that was really the whole issue was to be able to get um, her family to be able to get outside reasonably well uh, without too much of a hassle and not have to come down the ramp and pivot on the grass and come back to the, this little patio and sit there kind of staring at nothing. So uh, that's really the only reason why a simple deck is going through the machinations that we're going through now just to be able to get that approved. Okay. Thank you. Is there any reason why the deck could not be constructed in the front of the house? No, it's with anything is possible. Um, well, that's a, actually one of the criteria. Why don't we get to that? No, no other feasible alternative. Why don't we dive into the criteria here and we can address feasible alternatives no. at that time? Okay. That's, that's where I was going. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. So for a practical difficulty variance, there are seven criteria. So the first one is the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general condition in the neighborhood. Um, that is correct. The, uh, uh, the property was created uh, almost 100 years ago, and the house on it was built in 1930. Um, so that's about almost 90 years ago. Uh, so the, uh, it's the, and the position of the house being where it is on the lot uh, causes the uh, unique consideration. It's not an overall neighborhood consideration. It's purely the house's location on the lot when it was built in 1930. Number two, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of the abutting properties. Um, it will not produce a, uh, an undesirable change. In fact, it's, it's quite the other way around. Um, as we all know from many people's properties, no matter where they are, but particularly in the Pine Point and the Higgins Beach areas, um, there are a lot of people who try to enjoy the seasons uh, with homes, either uh, their primary homes or secondary homes in that particular area. And most of those homes have significant improvements, including decks. Uh, so if anything, this a deck on, uh, or an added deck to a property or to a house that doesn't have one is actually going to be a desirable effect on the neighborhood and enhance the character. Okay. Three, the practical difficulty is not the result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Uh, the practical difficulty is the result of uh, zoning basically overtaking a house and a property that was created, property over a century ago and a house almost 90 years ago with zoning having gone into effect uh, just a couple of decades ago. Number four, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Okay, now we can get into your question. Um, is there a feasible alternative? There's always a feasible alternative, or almost always there's a feasible alternative to something, whether it's doing nothing or doing everything that we might be asking for or something in between. Um, can you put a deck off the front of a house? Sure, structurally, you can certainly do that. Is it actually practical to be able to do that? There it becomes a subjective question. I mean, most of the time decks are off the back of a house. Um, the front of the house is fenced in. Uh, they do have a, do a dog, but the dog's not here all the time. Uh, when they are here, however, it's, it's fenced in with a chain link fence all the way around the front of the house. Um, and that's typically where the dog and the children, the grandchildren and the children play. Um, the deck is more because the house was set up for a, an entrance almost five feet above grade uh, in the back of the house, and that's typically where, the, where anybody's deck, or where this deck in particular, would be best situated on the property relative to the house. I noticed that there, there's an adjoining property with a, a separated by a stockade fence. And it appears that the, the height of the deck will be just about even with the top of the stockade fence. Is that accurate? Just looking at it from the um, it, that you the, showed. the uh, finished floor elevation of the deck will be a little bit lower than that. But yes, there, there are actually two little, stockade. How much does that mean? I beg your pardon? How much is a little? Uh, probably inches? about a, less than a foot. That's what I meant. Okay, less yeah. than a foot. Okay. Yep. So, so the, the neighbors would be able to just see right over the fence and there's the deck right there. That's yes, typically, but level. keep in mind though that the neighbor house, and again, it was one of the, actually this photograph right here shows the retaining wall, yeah. um, that uh, the neighbor's house is actually uh, considerably higher than this house is already. So almost anything that they would do would be able to allow them, that neighbor to be able, and that's a full two-story house, would be able to see into the backyard. 
Uh, that neighbor, by the way, John Tui, uh, was approached. I don't know if Brian has the letter or, or whether the, uh, um, the staff has the letter or not, but he was approached and uh, ostensibly was all for it. Um, so there's no issue as far as the neighbor is concerned. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, five, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Um, given that conformance is something that is where one house is somewhat similar in character to other houses that are around it, um, having a back deck or having a deck anywhere, but particularly a back deck, which is what most people have, uh, would enhance the conformity of the property relative to the neighborhood. Six, the granting of the variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. It would have no effect on the environment whatsoever. And seven, the property is not located in whole or in part within the shoreland area? It is not in the shoreland zone. Uh, Mr. Bork brought up a good point. Uh, these pictures make, make you, makes me a little nervous because you have a deck that's basically looking over right into the other neighbor's property. Um, and um, so what are they doing? Are they going to be doing anything there? Putting up a new fence? Or anything like that? Um, I have not spoken to the them about a fence. It's certainly possible. Um, I don't think, I mean, the, you never know. I mean, obviously, houses are there for a long time and people come and go, but uh, uh, the Tuis and the Magadas get along very, very well together. There's no issue as far as that's concerned. And uh, as far as the level of the deck, too, I would just point out that the windows of the houses, given that these are, this is like a one, one and a half story house, and the Tui property right next door is two stories. That's a relatively new structure. Um, anybody from any of the windows can see into anybody else's yard anyway. So it's not really going to matter as far as that actual fence is concerned. Given the condition of that fence, I would surmise, but it's only my surmising, that it's probably going to come down or get replaced anyway. It's in pretty sad shape. Do you know the height of the fence? I believe it's a standard five, five foot uh, stockade fence. Five foot, so it could be higher. It could be a little bit higher. Well, it could go higher if there's a new fence there. But yes, the reason I'm looking at this is that the, uh, the level of the deck um, is approximately five feet, and it looks like the, about the top of that fence is approximately five feet as well. Yeah. We'll get to that. We'll get to the public comment. Yeah, that's the next part. Yep. Did the board have any other further questions regarding the criteria specifically? I've got just a couple questions to follow up. With regards to the deck being placed out front, are there any other properties in the neighborhood that have decks in front? I haven't driven through the neighborhood with the express intent of looking at frontal decks. Um, there, are that have, there are many that have porches, the, the typical enclosed porches. Um, decks, it's sort of unusual to have a deck in the front of a house, not a landing so much with a front uh, opening for your door, but, uh, but to have a full deck in the front of the house. It's not to say it couldn't go there, but it's just not usual. It's a little unique as far as the property is, or as far as the neighborhood is concerned. Uh, when you take a look at some of these other properties, as Brian's showing you right now, there's not a whole lot of evidence of decks in the fronts of houses. And as a follow-up, is there an existing door, egress door on the front of the house that would accommodate? That proposed deck if it should um, be designed or located in the front there is a front door um, it's about five steps up but okay. uh, so there would still need to be steps coming up to the deck and that would even that but there is a front door a side door and a rear door thank you mm -hmm. any further questions Open it up to the public at this time. I don't know if there's anyone here that would like to speak. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Susan Hamill, and John Tuey is my brother. Okay. And um, he owns a house at 19 Jones Creek Drive. John couldn't be here. 19 Jones Creek Drive has been in my family um, since my dad bought it in probably 1965. And John owns it now. And um, you, are, you have seen the letter. Um, I would like to be sure that that letter, that letter is read into the record. Um, so should I just go ahead? It's not very long. Yep, go ahead. Okay. 
I would like to inform the zoning board that I do not approve of the proposed construction of the elevated patio deck abutting my property at 19 Jones Creek Drive, requiring a limited reduction of yard size variance. That's now been changed to the practical difficulty. The applicant is requesting a 370 square foot deck, 27 by 17 feet within 10 feet of my property. A portion of their house is already less than five feet from my property line. The variance before you should be denied. The zoning is in place to protect the privacy of residents as well as the character of the neighborhood. Pine Point has changed dramatically in recent years. As absentee ownership has grown and properties are utilized for vacation and party rentals versus homeowner residents, the need to enforce zoning regulations is essential to preserve privacy, character, and a sense of community for longer, year, ter, longer term year round residents. I feel that the construction of a large elevated deck so close to my property will be intrusive and violates the intent and purpose of the current zoning ordinances. It would infringe upon my rights to peaceful enjoyment of my property. I have invested a considerable amount of time, effort, and expense to build a new family home on Jones Creek Drive which I plan to occupy with my children for a lifetime. I knew the original owner of Five Tasker Avenue. I helped her for many winters and summers with her home repairs, preparing to shut it down for the winter and opening it in the spring as well as general upkeep. She was a permanent resident who occasionally had long-term rentals over the past 15 years. The new owners visit very infrequently and I have only seen them very briefly during a single visit once a year. And I would dispute what uh, the answer that this house is a rental house and it is a party house and um, so um, I don't I don't have records to show that but I can tell you that my brother John um, experienced uh, the, one of the most rec recent weekends that he was there um, there was a party a wedding going on all weekend um, reception and um, it was loud and dogs barking 24 hours a day. So to have this deck up so high, um, pretty much uh, really having a you know, clear shot right into his yard um, and that close, it just, just really doesn't make sense. The house has been there for 100 years, has been fine with a, a, the small area in the back and it would be very detrimental um, and which is criteria number two, number two, very detri detrimental to have such a large and high deck. It would really um, diminish the value of, of John's property. So okay. I hope that you take that into consideration. Thank you. Thanks May I ask that. a question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how would you feel about a, a, a small deck in the front of the house? Um, well, I can't speak for, for John I know, on I realize. that. Um, I think that uh, it, it gets it away from, farther away from his house. He does have a porch on the back side um, that, that uh, kind of looks out on, you know, the, the two backyards. They both have por porches or decks, so they, they're, you're, you're kind of looking at each other. Um, I don't think that he would experience that with the, if there was a deck on the front, but I can't say for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? I mean, we read the one letter. Is there anything else? Mr. Longstaff? No? Okay. If I may make one comment, or go ahead. I'll close the public hearing. Yes. Okay. Um, certainly entitled to your own opinion, absolutely. And, uh, and I'll do respect to uh, any of the butters, whoever they may be. As far as level of the deck is concerned, the windows of both houses are looking at each other pretty directly. Um, most of the time, when, but not all the time, when people have decks, they typically step out from wherever it might be, their kitchen, their dining room area, wherever it might be, onto a level deck. Right. If we were talking about a rooftop deck or something to that effect, which would certainly impugn somebody's ability to, for, to have privacy next door, that would be a different story. I guess I would just suggest to the board that I'm not sure what the height of the deck at the same level of the finished floor would have anything to do as far as privacy concerns. 
when we've got numerous windows on both houses that are looking out at the same level at each other anyway. Um, if it's more of an issue of the deck per se, then you know, are people entitled to decks? No, but many of us have them and we typically like them and we usually have them as easy as possible relative to the finished floors of our structures uh, without going up or down too far. So again, as far as the level is concerned, I'm not really sure that that's a major consideration. Um, Ms. McGowdy had told me that uh, she was under the impression that Mr. Tui, with whom apparently she gets along quite well, um, was if not favorably disposed, was didn't have that much of an issue with it. Apparently he does. I'm just not really sure what that issue is if it's really focused on the level of a deck when you can see everything that goes on anyway on both properties. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right now the board is gonna go through the criteria and discuss them. Uh, first, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general condition in the neighborhood. Uh, we've heard tonight that the existing dwelling was built in 1930 and is located approximately 20 feet from the rear property line. Um, they do have a unique property dealing with a small backyard. Um, Mr. Hebert? Um, as you just stated, it's a very small lot, um, so there are unique circumstances to the property that need to be taken into consideration. Um, but again, I'll, I'll thank you. Uh, as was stated, uh, the property size is very unique due to its small size and construction back in 1930. Um, I'll, I'll touch upon the uniqueness uh, again in a later question, but uh, not necessarily the fault of the general conditions of the neighborhood. It's because that's how the lot was drawn up at that period of time. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, this is, uh, I guess, a grandfather. Uh, no, it is conforming as it is. <coughs> is that fully understand? It's not totally. Not, not totally. totally conforming. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a unique lot in its size and its dimensions of the lot. So yeah, it certainly is something that uh, yeah I would agree. Okay. Ms. Torrance. So with this one, um, Mr. Longstaff, could you elaborate with? Could they actually put a similarly sized deck on the front within the building envelope without the variance? As you can see on the plan view that I'm showing you right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. the dash dot line here is the building envelope. That's what I thought. So if they wanted to connect to where the door is, They'd have to they switch. would have to be back in front of us for another variance. But that would just be for that little connectors. I'll spot. remind the board it's not our job to redesign the project. No, no, I'm okay. just it, it, in Sorry. evaluating whether there's a need for a variance. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that's, well, I guess it, it, what we just talked about actually does make it that there would be a need for a variance. So I guess I can agree with number one. Mr. Karen. No further comments. Ms. Water. Okay, all in favor of one being met, that's five. Number two, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of the abutting properties. I'd actually appreciate it. I know tonight we had testimony in regards to 19 Jones Creek Drive. I'm kind of curious as to where 19 Jones Creek Drive is. Is that who we're looking at at the back deck here? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, decks are common to many properties in the neighborhood. And the appellant states that there is vegetation and fencing to be provided screening of the deck, but the deck is high, I suppose, nearly as high as the top of the fence, and the existing vegetation provides little, if any, visual screening or buffering from the neighbor properties. Um, I appreciate the neighbors coming out here tonight. Um, she addressed kind of one of the concerns I had. This photo doesn't, doesn't help you guys. I don't like looking at this, sitting on this deck, looking right back into it. Um, I think I, I appreciate the concern of you're now taking the whole party directly out into the back deck. 
Um, one of the one of the powers that the board has is to set to set restrictions. Um, you know, kind of throwing it out there to the board tonight. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable for these folks who already have a door there and they have people who are handicapped who want to go outside outside their back deck. That doesn't seem unreasonable, but the board does have the ability to say, we want you to put in a higher fence in. We want you to put some vegetation in. Unfortunately, some of the information that she did provide was just in regards to rentals. I mean, that is something that the town allows. Deck, no deck, you're gonna, unfortunately, that is a very common problem in all of these towns, in all these towns and these beach areas and things like that. So there's really not much we can do about that, renting or not renting. Um, but we, I do appreciate the fact that I, when I look at that picture and we have someone here tonight telling us that, I don't know, Mr. Hebert, how do you feel about that? I mean, I think you, you, you summed it up nicely saying that, you know, everyone's, everyone is, um, everyone's entitled to rent their property in this area or do with their property as they will within the boundaries and constrictions of town ordinances. Um, an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood, not necessarily other homes have decks. Um, what does concern me is the fact that they went ahead and just started to build a deck. Um, whether there was, there was a level of just not knowing or ignorance to the existing laws that are in place or not, these are in place for a reason. Um, and that is, I just find it slightly discouraging uh, to see that the course of action was already taken just to go ahead and build something without seeking uh, the permitted approval from the town which at that time would have said to them, you can only build to a certain envelope, and that could have changed a lot of the footprint and a lot of the mess that's been going on in that, um, that situation. Generally, does this question, is this question answered? I think, I think yes, I think Mr. Fisher said that, um, you know, you have numerous windows and you have numerous homes at the same level, you're staring right into each other. I mean, this is, this is how these neighborhoods operate. You are looking into your neighbor's bathroom from your house, like that's, just the close proximity of all these lots and small homes that were built here 60, 70, 100 years ago. Um, will it have an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood by adding a deck? No. Okay, uh, so I agree. It, it won't make it out of uh, character to the neighborhood. However, I do have a concern about the proximity to the buddy neighbor and the height of that stockade fence. And the board does have the, the, the right to impose uh, <coughs> restrictions. Uh, and I would propose a 12-foot stockade fence, which would provide adequate buffer, you know, between the properties. Can if such a fence is uh, feasible, Are they allowed to have fences that high? Uh, currently, no. Uh, any, oh, fence, the any fence over seven feet in height requires a permit, and it's required to meet the setbacks. So they, they'd have to yeah. come back for a variance mm -hmm. to build a higher than seven foot fence. So that would be not a, not a reasonable request. However, vegetation certainly could be. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's no restriction on vegetation height. And yeah, but vegetation takes a long time to grow. Not if you plant tall vegetation. Right. Mm -hmm. This is true. <laughs> That's pretty costly. It could be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd be more inclined to decline uh, because of the proximity to the neighbor and uh, the feasibility of building in the front. As, a, as an alternative. Mm -hmm. So on this particular one, I'd have to say no. So I don't have a, um, a particular issue with the fact that uh, I don't think it would change or produce, produce any undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. I do question about the detrimental effect on the abutting properties. I do believe that the proposed deck is too close to the abutting property. Uh, there's a reason for setbacks and building envelopes, and I think, you know, stretching beyond that when I think there is somewhat of a reasonable alternative. Um, I, I, I can see where this would be, would have an adverse effect on the abutting owners. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, the pictures that we're looking at are not reflective of what the proposed deck is that's in our plants. Right. They're, they're larger. So that there, you know, there is some of that. I'm looking at the, um, you know, larger apparent footprint when we look at the pictures versus what we're actually looking at in the plans. But um, still just, you know, given the, 
these these properties are already very close together now uh, I don't I don't care what the height of the deck is or whatever I just think that you know the closer you put people to the to the property line you get somebody throwing something off a deck or whatever if it's a renter and you know it becomes it becomes an issue um, so I do have a problem with that as far as the abutting properties goes Upon hearing uh, what was presented this evening, I do not feel that this would be detrimental to the characteristic of the neighborhood. And, um, understand that the elevations and the sight lines of the two rear backyards um, are not great, but uh, it was shared this evening that there are opportunities to impose vegetation, um, which I would certainly favor if, um, if proposed. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Waters. Um, I think the height of the deck does have an impact on the abutting neighbor because uh, sound travels a lot more clearly yeah. when it's not blocked. Um, so if you're higher up, um, you're going to be hearing more. It's going to be broadcasted better at, a, at an elevated so I do think that the elevation is relevant of the deck. Um, could it possibly be that better drainage could occur in the back to be able to create the patio that you first intended? Can I answer that? Uh, we'll get to or, uh, maybe I should ask. Feasible alternative. Fe feasible alternative. Um, yeah. Kind of that one. Yeah. But we'll wait till that one. Yeah. But yeah. So that's it. Uh, I will Hi. ask you a question, Mr. Fisher. Okay. Uh, would Would the applicant have the financial ability to put in trees? I can speak unequivocally for the applicant toward that end and say if that's the criteria, absolutely. And when it comes to, you, I'm not an arborist, but we've been dealing with this for about 30 years. I can tell you that uh, trees that are, gen saplings that are generally up to about eight feet high tend to grow considerably more quickly than higher trees that are replanted, mm -hmm. taller trees. Uh, meaning that an eight to, I mean, it's certainly up to the board, you can impose any restriction that you wish. But uh, basically, a seven to eight to nine foot tree will actually surpass, typically within two to three years, any tree that's actually like 12 feet high now, because it assimilates much more, a larger tree assimilates much more slowly. The point being, and the answer to your question is, um, if that's the criteria, absolutely. We would even put in a higher fence, but as Brian mentioned, we would only get a, about an extra foot, um, as far as the height is concerned, because of this bowl within which that backyard sits. But the trees would be absolutely no issue. Uh, we could do something, Arborvita, for instance, grow fairly um, compact. They don't last that long, but they could last typically about 40 years, which is probably longer than any of us are going to be around toward that end. Um, and she would absolutely uh, agree to, and there's plenty of room then based on the, uh, the smaller deck size to be able to put uh, as many trees in there as possible. And again, with Arborvita, we usually plant them about six feet on center, uh, six feet apart where the trunks are, and then they typically grow together into a veritable wall, a vegetated wall. We'd be happy to do that. May I just on a point on that? Um, you know, you've, you've ta spoken about how wet and, you know, the, the backyard is in this particular case. Is that going to affect the ability of vegetation to grow? You know, is, is the right species going to be available that's going to be able to sustain, you know, good root structure in that, in that type of environment? Yes, typically, because keep in mind, this is not an actual wetland. The soils are not saturated. The soils are sandy. The issue is that uh, particularly at high tide, there's a, it, the tides don't come into this area by any means, but the pressure on the area of Pine Point, Higgins Beach, the sandy areas of the coast, et cetera, is such that when you do have a rain event and the rain all collects in one particular area, it's got nowhere to go um, so toward, until it literally gets dry enough to be able to saturate through the soils. So toward that end, it's plenty, it's good soils for growing. You can take a look at the other trees that are around the area. Um, that should be absolutely no problem. And you can also, uh, if that's a condition, you know, we just put a condition that if, a, uh, if the trees are planted or when the trees get planted, if any of them dies, they have to be replaced. Okay. Which they probably would be anyway, but that's an absolutely fine condition to put on there. Uh, all in favor of two, 
being met. That's fine. Okay. The practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or prior owner. As we know, the property was located, the dwelling was located on the property long before the, loaning, the zoning ordinances and yard setbacks were established. Mr. Hebert? The, it's, not, it's not the owner's fault that the lot is so small. Um, that's really the number one fact that we're looking at here. Um, there are other concerns that I have with this, um, but um, with regard to the practical difficulty not being a result of the applicant or prior owner, it's, that's the way the plot was made. Mr. Agreed. Ms. Torrens. Agreed. Mr. Parrott. Agreed. It was shared that the house is approximately 90 years old. Correct. Agreed. Okay. All in favor of three being met? It's five. Four. No other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Um, the permitted building window here where a deck could be located without a variance is approximately five feet wide by 20 feet long, while the maximum lot coverage is only allowed a deck approximately five feet by eight feet in the area. And we've discussed some different sort of feasible alternatives. Um, my sort of interpretation in regards to feasible alternative is feasible alternative to deal with the door that they have on the back of their house. Feasible alternative to deal with people in wheelchairs who need to get out of the house in the back. Mr. Hebert? I agree uh, that looking at it from that perspective, yes, you have a five foot wide double door that is wheelchair accessible. What are you going to do with that if you can't put a deck there? You're going to have to seal that up because you, where is that door going to go? Um, I guess an underlying <coughs> concern that I have here is that in general, um, you know, feasible, with discussing feasible alternatives, you know, the concern that the applicant was unaware of Mr. Chewy's grave concern about the deck being placed there. Um, I feel like if there was some coordination between the two, the applicant and the neighbor about this, some, there could have been a reasonable um, sort of accommodation made in this, or at least a discussion that took place. Granted, that doesn't necessarily address the criteria of number four, no feasible alternative. You can put a deck anywhere. You don't have to have a deck in your backyard. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that's, they're, they're limited to that, that square footage based on the uniqueness circumstances from number one that we indicated of the property. It's a very, very small lot. Um, a point made, excellent point made by Jennifer earlier, uh, larger jack equals more people, which equals a lot more sound, which carries. Um, that is not, again, doesn't directly affect number four, but that plays into other criteria in the application as well. Um, so I have a real hard time with this as the deck is presented uh, currently. Um, and again, it shows the footprint clearly on the, on the survey about where they could um, potentially add a deck. But again, unique circumstances of the neighborhood. Um, this is a very small house and a very small property. It's already unique. So having a deck in the front of the house is not unique. And as Mr. Longstaff said, we are not architects or designers, um, so we should be careful about suggesting um, design criteria to the applicant that they may interpret as a, uh, well, if you do this, then that's okay. We should be very careful about that. Right, and I mean, the only alternative we said was put it on the front, but as we just said, to even put a deck on the front, they would still need a variance. That is true. Mr. Bork? Now, given that, uh, and we've already addressed the issue of vegetation, uh, to buffer the back, uh, I don't have a problem at all with uh, this particular criterion. <clears throat> Ms. Torrance. I still take issue with this no feasible alternative available. Um, and I think largely because when we've, when we've asked you about why select the back versus the front and the, the explanation has been primarily, well, decks just don't go on the front kind of is the thing. Mm. And, and I, as a real estate agent, I can tell you, I see plenty of them. <laughs> um, so I, it's, it's kind of a, 
this is a hard thing for me to reconcile. If if you told me, you know, at the the um, you know, trying to create any kind of entry out to the front would have been an, a problematic because of uh, position of a kitchen or something like, you know, something to that effect. I might have an easier time getting around this one, but um, I, I personally feel like the, the the deck could probably have gone in the building em within the building envelope. Um, and again, as you know, it's not up to us to to redesign the the deck or anything like that. But uh, when it comes to the question of no other feasible alternative, I I'm not convinced that that standard's been met. May I address that comment, or should we wait till everybody's done? Sorry, we're going okay. to move along. Mr. Karen. All right, thank you. Um, with the reading of number four, no other feasible alternative as available except for a variance. Um, <clears throat> we've discussed how, while there is a possibility of putting the deck in the front, not uh, influencing any design, uh, in order to meet that existing entry in the front, it would still require a variance. Um, so in other words, if a deck was to put uh, be moved to the front, a new entry uh, without the need of a variance would be required. Right. Ms. Waters. No, we're, I'm sorry. We're, the, we're, no, that's all right. We're just, it's the board discussion now. Do you have any um, comments on other feasible alternatives? All in favor of four being met. We got two. And those against? That's three. Oh, did you say opposed? I'm sorry. Yeah, opposed. Hand out. <laughs> sorry, Harry. I'm, I'm sorry. That was, what, we, what was the vote? Was that three to two? Three to two. It was three to two. In, in okay. favor. I raised my hand twice. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Stand corrected. Okay, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Um, you know, you've testified tonight, I'm familiar with Pine Point area, we're familiar with all the beach town, like beach areas in here, and um, conformance, it, it's bringing it into, making it more similar, and you're gonna find other properties in the area who have those. It's not unreasonable for them to want to have a deck. Mr. Hubert? I agree. Um, again, this in conformance with surrounding properties, and I mean this entire neighborhood is pretty much non-conforming. So there really isn't. What are you conforming to? Um, you're conforming to non-conformity. Um, do other homes have decks in the area? Yes. Um, does it come and bring it into conformance as far as this house has a deck? Other houses have decks. I would like to have a deck as well. Yes, that satisfies that requirement. Uh, yes, agreed, very reasonable. Ms. Torrance? Um, to Mr. Hebert's point, I, I agree that, that uh, there is no conformity in this neighborhood as it is, but uh, you know, so I have no problem with this one in, in either direction. <laughs> no further comment. All in favor of five being met. That's five. Six, the granting of the variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Now, the proposed deck is 190 square feet larger than the 200 square foot deck exemption that Maine DEP allows for open decks in Chapter 355, Section 3AA when calculating the structure area. Um, we've had some testimony in regards to what the property is like, in regards to what type of water is there, why it's there, why it's sitting there. Mr. Hebert? Yep, there isn't anything, uh, there is there anything special that we need to um, additionally add to this. It won't have an adverse effect on the natural environment. The environment comes and goes already. I mean, there's water, um, there's water infiltration onto the property. It comes and goes. But having a deck there, uh, on um, on supports won't interrupt the flow of the annual flooding that occurs. Agreed. Agreed. <coughs> Agreed. Okay. Yeah, yes. If I may, mm -hmm. um, 
Jim, did the, you haven't applied for a permit by rule for this yet, probably. Correct. It's in the back dunes, so one would be required. Yes. And the fact that you're going to exceed um, DEP's 20% building coverage probably with the excess amount of deck. I'm just wondering if they'll even permit. The DEP doesn't consider decks. They don't it, consider decks that are 200 square feet or less. Okay, stand corrected. <laughs> so you may, you know, I, I was just curious to know if that discussion had happened yet. Because um, you, you, even if you were successful with an appeal, you might not be able to build the, the 370 square foot deck. Uh, that's certainly possible. Um, I'm not going to second guess the DEP. Uh, and ne neither am I because it's not my regulation, it's theirs. Sure. So. We understand that. Absolutely. All in favor of six being met. Number seven, the property is not located in whole or in part within the shoreland area as defined in 38 MRSA section 435 or the flood hazard zone as defined in the town of Scarborough floodplain management ordinance. Madam Chair, I can verify it's not the shoreland zone or okay. special flood hazard area. All in favor of seven being met, not shoreland. Okay, so as part of a practical difficulty variance, the following words have the meaning set below. Now we talk about dimensional standards, these provisions of the ordinance which relate to a lot our area coverage, frontage and setback, including buffer and requirements. Practical difficulty, this is what we're going to talk about. A case where the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in a significant economic injury to the applicant. So the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also result in a significant economic injury to the applicant. The strict application of the dimensional standards would result in a deck that is roughly five feet by eight feet, which is very small. Decks, unlike landings or stoops, are customarily used for outdoor furniture tables or outdoor dining and outdoor cooking appliances. A five foot by eight foot deck would not be allowed adequate space for any of these uses. So we clearly, as this is a permitted use within the zone, the question is, do you believe this is significant economic injury? Mr. Hubert. I don't think so. I mean, as, as stated, there are other options that they can pursue here that um, there are, again, feasible, feasible alternatives that they can do um, by, I mean, not having a deck here does not cause them undue financial difficulty. I mean, they do have a door there, though. So there is some sort of injury and economic recourse for having a sliding door that they're going to have to probably what remove fill in there um, is some mr bork uh well not only that but we have uh, uh relatives who are uh, wheelchair bound uh, who would not be able to uh, enjoy the backyard at all were it not for this deck and um, so that would be a hardship of use uh, for those people so that's a unique uh, circumstance. So I, I always want to say yes with these. I really do. I always want to be able to let people do whatever they want to do with their property, provided it doesn't get in the way of anybody else's enjoyment. But I do struggle with this one. I think that there is probably a need for a variance, but I don't necessarily believe that this is the proper design or, or or um, I guess I don't agree that this is the best way to go about this. So I, I just can't, I can't support it. I do not see that there would be particular financial hardships um, based on the inability to provide a deck. I mean, they already built a deck. 
I have to say, I feel bad for her. You know, I would go out and hire a handyman and probably be in the same situation. And I'm the chair of the zoning board. Um, you know, so she's dealing with. She's already suffered a significant economic injury because she's dealing with a deck that was improperly built. Um, and now they have a door that they want to use, um, and there is going to be some sort of economic response negatively if they have to remove all this and deal with that. All in favor? Can I? Yes. Can I make a comment Absolutely. on that? This board has heard other cases. Um, there, in fact, you know, not too, not too far back, we heard a case about. Uh, couple who wanted to put on a deck because they already had two sliding doors that were looking out towards the beach and we said no because it, and they had actually already had a deck or, or the prior owner had had a deck and had had to have it removed because they had built it you know under the same kind of circumstances um, I think in, a, in an effort to be consistent I think you know we have to there there are certain procedures and there are certain rules and one of our as much as I don't like rules most of the time um, you know there there are reasons for this and I think you know the owner was aware that there were zoning rules to, to contend with um, and could have done better due diligence about making sure that whoever she did hire went about the proper process um, I, I also don't believe that just because there is a door means that it has to be used for the exact purpose that it was there. Um, in this, like I said, in the similar case of the, the, the sliding doors that went to nowhere. Um, I, would, I would feel better about being able to approve this if there were some way for me, for you to have said to me, you know, this is the only place for a door that will work for that purpose. Um, or that there was that this was the only, you know. I mean, if she's willing to put trees in, could she put a door in someplace else? You know, could could that could that possibly work? Uh, so those are the questions in my mind, and that was just my thoughts that I wanted to share. Right, Madam Chair. Yes. May I add? Mm -hmm. um, and I have to respectfully I'll disagree with you. Um, I mean, this, the undue financial hardship of removing this deck that's already in place is the fault of the applicant. Um, they unfortunately brought it on themselves by not pursuing the correct, I'll say, legal avenues of obtaining a building permit, which is, I mean, I, I'm sure it's, it may not be common sense to address the town and say, I want to build a deck here. Can I do that on my small property, on my already very small, unique property that's already here, abutting neighbors right next door? Um, I just, I've, I find it hard to believe that, well, I don't want to say that, but the undue hardship is the fault of the applicant here in this case. So financial hardship is brought on themselves, unfortunately. Well, I think we're just asking if we don't pass this, will they incur a significant economic injury? Yes or no? And that answer would be yes. Um, where are we, Mr. Karen? I think I may have spoken. I, I do not feel that um, the inability to provide a deck will provide any increased financial hardship. Um, May I add a, another comment? Um, we, have, we have people with special needs here, and I think it's reasonable to take into consideration loss of use uh, in looking at this. I'm very sensitive to that as well because I have a son with cerebral palsy, so I totally, I totally look at these things and want to make that, that consideration. So it's, it's, it's hard to say that I disagree with this. It really is. Madam Chair, if I can, yes. um, <clears throat> I have the we have the ability built into our zoning ordinance um, to grant disability variances for um, households yes. that require wheelchair access. That does not take a board action. I can do that. Right. With there are certain conditions that we put on it. So, <coughs> if the door can't be moved, you know, to to accommodate a deck that maybe could could. Well, nothing's going to fit in that building envelope other than a very small one, but 
perhaps it would remove some of the concerns of the proximity to the neighbor as no neighbor to the back of the property has complained, only the neighbor to the side, okay. not mm -hmm. that that's necessarily uh, in the bill. My point is I could grant a, a, a disability variance to construct a ramp or some, some access out of that door so that it's not rendered useless. I cannot permit a deck, but I can permit access. Um, and that, that might go down to a, a better designed patio that's raised and not sitting in the water. And again, we're not trying to design the project. There, there are some alternatives that could allow them some use, and patios do not require a variance. So there, there might be some way to get some smart engineering firm to design a patio <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, could, could get, grant them access to the backyard with a ramp constructed out off that door. And it might not look exactly like what they were thinking of doing, but it, it could, could kind of solve some of that problem. Again, not saying that that has to be done, but that is a possibility. And if the door is a concern, that could be dealt with. Um, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Briefly. Um, the door, obviously the door is a concern. Primary, uh, it, it's not the only door. I'm, I'm very, I often say there's often feasible alternatives to anything. Um, almost with patience, tenacity, and money, almost anything can be done. Um, but it's that practical difficulty. It's not a hardship. Is it difficult from a practical perspective to do anything else toward that end? The door, because it was structurally part of the, the component of the house, again, almost 100 years ago, is pretty much where it's got to be um, relative to the layout of the house. Uh, the, the living room wraps around there with the chimney. Um, it would be structurally questionable to redo the door. Now, Brian certainly has a point. We could actually go down to the, uh, we could make a ramp, it would be a long ramp to get down five feet. But the issue, and we are an engineering firm, and this is one of the first questions that I asked Ms. Magado when she said, what can you do to, to be able to help us out? And I said, well, put a patio in there. And that's when she explained about the water. So we actually did some uh, uh, brief modeling of the micro watershed. The issue that we have here, and I think this addresses Ms. Waters' uh, question, is that this is the lowest area of the entire uh, micro watershed that we've looked in the entire neighborhood, basically. And what's going to happen is if we raise this area up, if we put in enough fill to an area that is already the repository of stormwater from other people's properties, we'd end up filling that up to a point to get above that stormwater. But well, where does that stormwater go? Because this is the lowest area in that entire neighborhood. The stormwater doesn't have anywhere else to go. It's easy to be, it's relatively easy to be able to engineer a fix if we've got some outfall someplace, typically on the property or in the public infrastructure, that's lower than the property that we're trying to drain. In this case, this is by far the lowest area. Water isn't going to be displaced until we get up so high where we end up pushing that water onto somebody else's property. That's not going to go over very well. And actually, from the DEP's perspective, that's against the law. We can't do that. Um, so unfortunately, filling that from a stormwater perspective, filling is easy, but the stormwater perspective makes it considerably more challenging. Um, and just all things considered, it's more of the, the practical difficulty. Is it difficult to be able to put something out there the way it was intended, obviously, with the uh, the egress door and the back. Um, and as Brian mentioned, there's not a whole lot of anything that could go back in the actual envelope. So with the door being where it is, especially the wider door that opens up, there, there are half doors that open up to be able to allow uh, handicap access through there relatively easily. We'd end up having to come out further than where the building envelope exists just to be able to get almost anybody, but especially somebody in a wheelchair, to be able to get out that door and pivot and then get back to the, uh, the actual deck itself. We're not depriving anybody of life, liberty, et cetera, but the pursuit of happiness, perhaps. Um, and toward that end, I, I just want to point out again that it, it's difficult from a practical perspective to be able to put a deck anywhere else on this property. Do we have to have a deck? Of course not. We could live in a tent. But every, not everybody, most other people in this neighborhood do have these decks, and we just want to be able to enjoy what other people are enjoying. And toward that end, is there a financial consideration? Of course. These properties, as well as many of the other um, projects that you have come before you, uh, a lot of the properties in the Pine Point and the Higgins Beach areas are being redone uh, quite nicely. Not hugely, but they're being done really nicely, or very nicely. In this particular case, this is an older home, structurally sound to be sure, but are we going to suffer not a financial hardship, but a difficulty if we don't have something toward this end when the rest of the neighborhood is kind of growing up around us toward that end? 
So again, it's not a, a hardship that we're looking at is we're here because it would be practically difficult for us to be able to do this without being able to take advantage of going into or beyond the side setbacks a little bit. And uh, um, as Mr. Hebert uh, indicated earlier in the evening, these setbacks on very, very small lot, the setbacks are made generically for the zones in which they're located. These lots are tiny, relatively speaking. There's really not much that anybody can do, not just this project, but anyone, without coming to this board and asking for an exception. So is there a financial consideration toward that end? If everything else is growing around us pretty well, but we're suffering because we've got a property that was created over 100 years ago and a house 90 years ago, um, that, to me, does cause a practical economic consideration. Thank you. We're going to vote on eight. All in favor of eight being met. Those, that's two. Opposed? Right. Melinda, I'm sorry, how did you vote? The, so, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm looking, I'm looking at something different. So we're voting right now on the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance of the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property for which permitted in the zone is located and also result in a significant economic injury to the applicant. Two, that's what I thought. So it was two, four, and three opposed. Two yes, four no. Correct. Wait, that's six. We only have five. Two to three. Two to three. Three. Thank you. Um, I don't know if the board would entertain some sort of motion in regards to passing this and then putting some sort of contingency on in regards to the abutting property and possibly putting some vegetation and plants and things like that. I don't really want to dive deep into it. I feel like Mr. Fisher gave a couple good suggestions. I don't know if we have any motions. I'll move to approve appeal number 2665 as presented. Second. Um, I guess at this point, does someone want to make a motion to include vegetation as a, as a, um, as a requirement for passing this? Well, you can't. You voted, you voted no on that last. Yep. Thing, so it, that's right. It's dead. There's no point in yeah. that's kind of where putting thought. conditions. We, we, yeah. yeah, right. right. I you have to say no. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we had a motion. Did we have a second? Yes, we did. Okay. So all in favor? And all opposed? I think we got a little information there at the end about the handicapped accessibility and things like that. It sort of seems like there might be some sort of feasible alternatives that were just were not explored all the way for the board. I apologize. We are going to take a two-minute recess. Thank two you. minutes.
for 370 Payne Road is presenting a miscellaneous appeal. I'm going to ask Mr. Longstaff to please give us a little background first. Very briefly, this is just an expansion of a non-conforming residential uh, use in a general business district. It's a single-family dwelling. Um, the owner of the single-family dwelling uh, leases the, the, the uh, residence out to a, a, a renter, but he would like to construct a 30 by 60 residential accessory building, a garage, um, uh, located on the property uh, in order to store some things that are already sitting outside and just, just be able to tidy up the place, I guess, um, for lack of a better explanation. Mr. Haskell. <laughs> yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jason Haskell with DM Roma Consulting Engineers. Um, here on behalf of A-plus party uh, tents and events um, for the 370 Payne Road uh, garage expansion or garage construction. Um, at the time of the original construction of the unit, it was considered an allowed use to have a residential structure in the B3 zone. Since it's been rezoned, it's now considered a non-conforming use. So the applicant is now looking to build a 30 by 60 uh, garage with carport overhang on one side, um, accessory to the house to be utilized for uh, storage of some of the items that are out there already, and then um, other items for the tenants, and to make it more attractive for any future residential tenants. Um, to extend the residential use to this garage, we will be looking for a miscellaneous appeal. Um, Brian, if you could move to the uh, architectural sure. uh, elevation view. Um, the structure that will be built is going to resemble uh, an old rustic barn with a gambrel roof on one side, on both sides, uh, uh, with a working hay-style door, kind of where the, the hay would originally come into on an old barn. It's going to be more of a burgundy color. Um, there's no proposed bathrooms or sinks, so there'll be no connections to sewer or water or any other public utilities at that. <clears throat> Uh, the garage will be accessed by an existing driveway um, that's currently being utilized for the renters, so there's no uh, anticipated increase in traffic. Um, all around, the extension of the residential use of the garage will have less impact um, when compared to the surrounding commercial properties with respect to utilities, traffic, stormwater, public safety, noise generation, and even the overall appearance of the garage. Um, I have right here a uh, few images of some of the units down the, some of the commercial properties down the road. Um, the, the top one actually almost kind of resembles a barn with the same hay door and everything like that. And they actually almost have the same look of a residential structure. So I believe the appearance of it will be in conformance with the the surrounding buildings. Um, we have also added roof line drip edges to the building to provide a stormwater treatment measure and uh, erosion control. Um, it is the property itself is in the shoreland zone, um, but all the work will be kept outside of the shoreland zone. On September 23rd, we did meet with the planning board and they did have a positive outlook on it. They did have a few requests which are included in the packet that I gave you. Um, they, uh, one of the board members wanted an additional row of silt fence along the shoreland zone to, de to delineate it for the contractor during construction so they don't, it's just an extra level of assurance that they won't get in further into it. Um, there was a comment about the clarification of a uh, building cross section. Um, and one of the other concerns was what makes the, the tenants not use this for any business purposes or anything like that. So what we did was we added in the lease agreement that will be used um, that it cannot be used for a, a business or a commercial use. And that's... For a renter or for the owner? So it, it's currently being rented. Mm -hmm. So that's... And um, to add to that, we also have a note on there that says this building, this garage will only be used for residential uses any commercial business or I can't remember how I worded it now right. that it that will be prohibited and only approved by the planning board. 
Okay, I just want to clarify that you're not restricting the renting, but the owner could still use it as commercial. You're saying no one can use it as commercial. Correct. Is what they said. Okay. And thank you for reminding Madam me that Madam I did Chair, that. <laughs> I would make that clarification. Should the owner ever wish to switch the property entirely to a permitted use, he may do that, but only by going back to the planning board for site plan review. Correct. Just to be clear. As long as it's in a residential use, that condition will apply. Correct. Thank you, Brian. And that's all I have. I'm here to answer any of your questions. Does the board have any questions before we get into some of the criteria? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, you've gone over. Did we read? Oh, sorry. We described it, the justification. So now you have to go through the criteria for a special exception. And so I'm gonna read through those if you can just give the answers. Yep. Uh, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal emissions to the air or water or other aspects of its design or operation. Uh, so the garage won't have a bathroom or any floor drains or anything of that sort, so there'll be no increase in sewage of any kind from this garage. B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um, it's an existing driveway curb cut that's being used by the renters at this point, so I don't see any increase in traffic. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would substantially be different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. It'll be a less, uh, in, less uh, uh, high use as the commercial business is around it. So we don't see there'll be any increase in that. D, the proposed use will not create sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Uh, erosion control measures will be utilized during construction and we've also included um, the the roof line drip edges to allow the water that's coming off the roof to infiltrate or uh, be spread out over the, the uh, grass that's around it. Right. E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Um, the existing commercial structures, uh, uh, the existing commercial structures along Payne Road resemble residential structures, and some of them even have the rustic design, uh, barn design. Um, the abundant properties typically will have the structures relatively close to one another, or to one another with locations closer to Payne Road. F, if located in the shoreland zone as depicted on the Town of Scarborough official shoreland zoning map, the proposed use will comply with all the requirements of the Town of Scarborough shoreland zoning ordinance. Um, yes, uh, we're not proposing any work within the shoreland zone. Correct. G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Uh, they are uh, record owners of the property. H, the applicant has a technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection five of this section. So it's our understanding that A plus party tents and rents uh, doing business as A plus party rentals does have the financial capacity to move forward with this. And he did, instead of going through and trying to do this by himself, he did bring in us to help him through the permitting process. And also he did get an architect he may be from Washington, but he's a certified uh, professional uh, building designer. And I, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. Uh, we're thinking that the residential garage is gonna have a lot less noise than some of the commercial properties around there. Correct. Okay. Did the board have any questions? Yes. Uh, what, what is the footprint of the house, square footage? It's about 800 to 900 square feet. And what about this um, garage? Um, it was 1,800 square feet. Okay. 
why so big and how many cars does that hold? Just, that's huge. Yeah, it's it, it's a relatively large, but he, right now, if you go by there, there's several boats and other vehicles parked out there. So it's more trying to clean up the property and give it some type of enclosure. Okay, so it's to get it's for storage. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and and how how wide is the garage door? Is that single, double, or how big? How wide is that? Uh, it is a nine. I believe it was a nine foot wide door. I put so that single. It would be a single bay, but it's a twelve foot tall uh, door. I don't know if you've seen the par property, Mr. Bork. They've, they've already got enough pro stuff on there to yeah. put in. The oh, I know, I know that, but it just you know. Um, it'll clean it up. Okay, but I'm just wondering. Okay, just just wanted to get an idea of the scope of it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, I'm going to close it and open it to the public. I don't know if there's anyone here that would like to speak tonight or if we received any phone calls or letters. We did okay. So I'm going to close the public and now the board is going to go through the criteria and do our findings of facts and conclusions of law. So A, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water or other aspects of its design or operation. The proposed structure and its use is for dry storage and will not require sewage disposal or will create any emissions to the air or water. What I've heard tonight, Mr. Hebert? No, uh, the applicant stated that, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll correct the applicant, there will be one public utility, electricity, and that will just be for receptacles and lighting inside of the building, but there, he stated and shows on the plans that it's not going to be any water, so there's not going to be any kind of considerations for drainage, sewage, Agreed. I believe he's demonstrated that effectively. Yes, Mr. Karen. Agreed. All in favor of A, B, and <coughs> B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when adding to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. The proposed expansion will utilize the existing driveway and yard area and will have no impact on the existing residential use. That's what I've heard tonight. There's not going to be any commercial property and businesses being run there. They're strictly just storing stuff. Mr. Hebert? Correct. Yep. They're just, they're strictly just storing material there. Um, there's not going to be anybody coming and going. It's not a staging area or a loading area for um, another commercial entity. Agreed. Yeah, I see no change in what's what's currently going on at the property, and it's just going to improve it. Agreed. It's going to be residential. Okay. All in favor of B being met. C. The proposed use will not create public safety problems, which will be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood. It will require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than the existing uses in the neighborhood. The expansion of the single family residence used by the addition of a 30 by 60 foot accessory storage building will, will require no greater degree of municipal fire police protection than any other existing commercial uses in the district. Um, Mr. Hebert? Again, uh, it's used strictly for dry storage. There's not going to be any uh, other utilities there or reason to have a gathering that would warrant um, an increased police or fire department activity. Agreed. 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 Okay, all in favor of C being met. Is that five? Yep. Uh, D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supply. Uh, the expansion of the single-family residential use by the addition of an accessory building will increase the impervious area on the 2.6-acre parcel by approximately 3,085 square feet and will disturb approximately 5,800 square feet, as we've heard tonight. But the erosion con controls will be utilized during construction, including a double row of silt fence along the shoreline boundary. And the building will incorporate a perimeter roof line drip edge to the treat stormwater runoff from the roof and you know as we know we that before the planning board already who put these on them mr hebert um took my points uh, i was going to mention <laughs> the they're installing the silt fence and erosion control um 
And there are also, he mentioned uh, more than once, the roof line drip edge to help mitigate any sort of uh, issues that could happen during or post construction. Uh, yes, the applicant has taken reasonable uh, steps to control erosion. Yes, he's, he's obviously integrated erosion control measures sufficiently according to the design plan. Agreed. In addition to adding an additional secondary line of cell phones. Agreed. All in favor of D being met. <coughs> e, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. I mean, that is just a weird, hard, of pain road. I think I think it's great that you brought those in today. We actually went the bottom picture with someone who has been before us. Um, and so, you know, I think we're somewhat familiar with that area. It's kind of a tricky area. Um, the residential accessory building is not substantially different than any of the existing commercial structures that were there one time in, in the residentials as well. I, I agree. You also demonstrated that there are other existing commercial structures that Again, as he stated, resemble structures that he's trying to go for uh, with the Campbell style roof. Agreed. 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 Thank you for the photos. Agreed. Okay, so all in favor of E being met. <coughs> F, if located in the Shoreland Zone in Scarborough. Um, the proposed use will comply with all the requirements of the Town of Scarborough's Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. Uh, the limits of disturbance for the project as proposed are not within the Shoreland Overlay District and therefore are not subject to any of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance requirements as we've heard tonight. The board agrees. Agreed. Yeah, all in favor of F being met. Uh, the applicant has sufficient right title or interest in the site of the proposed use should to be able to carry out the proposed use. Um, we provided. provided a deed tonight showing that. So all in favor of G being met. H, the applicant has a technical and financial ability to meet the standards of the section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals. A plus tents and rentals has been, is it A plus party rentals? A plus tents and rentals has been in business for years and has the financial capacity to meet any reasonable conditions I believe this board would impose. Um, it has retained a, consult a consultant here to present them to uh, Mr. Hebert. Again, they've demonstrated by hiring the services of DMRO Consulting that they have the financial m means to um, provide design and fill out the application in order to uh, pass this. And obviously, they're an established business with uh, history. Agreed. Have yeah. Been paid yet? <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to throw it. I wasn't going to ask, ask <laughs> about that, but at least they do have the technical ability to have hired you, at least. <laughs> and they had the good yeah. sense to do so. So thank you. Agreed. Okay. All in favor of I being met? Uh, how about H? H. Sorry. <laughs> that was H. I'm just waiting. Right. We could do I too. <laughs> So I, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to generation of noise and operations of hours, hours in operation. This is a residential accessory use that is not anticipated to generate any additional noise after its construction and it will be not be any less compatible than the commercial uses on the abutting properties. I agree and it's not meant to be occupied either so you're not going to have an ability to generate additional noise because no one's going to be living in it. Mm -hmm. No, no impact whatsoever. Agreed. Agreed. <coughs> All in favor of aye being met. Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve uh, appeal number 2668 as presented. I'll second. All in favor? That's five. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Now we have a special exception, exception home occupation application for 8 Arbor View Lane. I'm going to ask Mr. Longstaff. He's ready. When he's ready, 
give us a quick <laughs> background. Come on, we're doing as much as we can here. Actually, just let's go ahead. Why don't you there go, go ahead? Yep, go for it. Good evening. My name is Patrick Mutri. I live at 8 Arborview Lane. I am current owner with my wife. Um, Johanna Mutri, also um, business owner with my daughter, Kaylee Mutri. <laughs> um, for Little Puddle Jumpers Daycare, we're approved daycare for a home family daycare for three to six. Right now, we would like to expand it to the 12 kids. Okay. And a lot of this is due in part. Um, we, we were previous, we had the daycare open for the last nine years. We shut it down. She wanted to go with, uh, try something different, went back into the medical field, and after getting many phone calls um, from friends and saying, please reopen, um, and then noticing the influx of uh, housing that is going on in our lovely town of Scarborough uh, between the Eastern Trail, the Dunson, and now the Downs. Um, we have found that there is no uh, aftercare at the school anymore, so we have also provide that. Um, so this moving from 6 to 12 would allow this to happen. Uh, and we have ready for your questions. <laughs> Keep going. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to say anything. Nope. Mm -hmm. Keep right on going. All right. So we're just going to dive into the criteria. I don't know if the board has any questions before I get into this. We'll deal with them as we go. <laughs> I don't have any questions. None. None. Okay. Oh, come on. Not one. Just, no, oh, just, just one. Mm -hmm. Until we'll get ten feet. <laughs> okay. okay. So the standards for the special exceptions. The proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reasons of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. That is correct. 99% um, of these children are all in diapers. So the only two people using the facility would be my daughter and my wife. Uh, we do have two, <coughs> two other boys that live at the house, but they will not be there. They'll be in school and after school sports. So. There actually, the re there will be a reduction of usage of sewage <laughs> in our home and water. So, do you only do infants? Um, no, I have infants to to school age, but um, we don't have any school age right now. And with the state laws, we are only, um, the daycare is only allowed to have six under two and six over two. So it would be that even split. Mm -hmm. B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when adding to the existing or foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Uh, as I wrote, there will be no creation of a parking area. The temporary parking area for pickup and drop off will be done in the current driveway, which is wide enough. Uh, it's a t it's two car plus. Um, there should be a picture up there. Yeah. Um, so the, it will not create any uh, unsafe conditions. So, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, are how many of these children will be like siblings that might be p being picked up by one parent versus yeah. so, so multi multiple multiple yeah, multiple kids yeah. multiple kids for this for one car right? So we have like one parent that has four kids. So if you're going to, I'm really so sorry, if you're going to talk, you're going to have to go okay. up here so we can get all okay. of it. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no I'm sorry. I'm not no, no, no. No, it's okay. Um, so what we do, we have several parents. With, I was going to say that remote mic would uh, probably work yeah, if you brought it to her. Totally um, I just want to make sure we capture you. No, that's mm -hmm. fine. Answer to your question, we have several parents with several so kids. I suspected. Yes. Just so, wanted to. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, before we go on to the next one. Uh, so you do have a turnaround, so if people who pull in have a way of backing up into the, Correct. the, the turnaround yeah. and then pulling a straight out onto the street, Correct. which is a requirement. It, correct. It was, a, it was a grassy area, which I have now put crushed stone in uh, as part of the property. And uh, right now we have um, three cars anyway, myself, right. her, and my son. And, and so it, it, but it is plenty, uh, there's plenty of room to pull in back and do a three-point turn. And okay. is Arborview Lane, uh, it, it is a major feeder road, I think it's called, right? We are one step over. We're one step a sub-collector. Sub sub yeah, sub-collector, yeah, yeah, which makes it a 
what a wider yes. road? One step higher yeah. than the resident. Which is a requirement, I believe, of, yeah. uh, of being able to get uh, uh, more kids. Yeah. yeah. How many families do you have now? Um, five families. Some of which are. I mean, I haven't, I'm not, time. we're not technically open. Um, we're opening November 4th. So um, we're in the process of enrolling kids and we're not going any further than the six kids a day. So until we know. Great. Right. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about kind of where these parents are parking and what happens when more than one parent is showing up. I mean, mm -hmm. the picture you provided shows a car parked on the road. And I think one of the things, I mean, I don't know if are they, I don't think oh, they that want. That's a family member visiting that car right there. Yeah. Um, and so I just don't, I, I see some concerns with now, you said you have five families and now you're going to expand where you could have up to 12 children. You could have six, seven, eight, you know, um, families coming down mm -hmm. the road, increasing the traffic in a residential area to a driveway that I'm having a hard time seeing how these vehicles are going to be able to maneuver in and out of the driveway mm -hmm. without, if there's more than one or two, you know, are they going to be able to back out? Or it seems like people are going to be in the road. They're going to be backing into the road. It doesn't really seem like there's enough area for them to turn around. And then, Fair enough. Um, the, if you put your cursor to the top right there, a little bit further, there's the mailbox. So that area right there is actually where the crush stone has been, uh, been put. Um, that, that is a 18 by 18 area, which would allow, if they even pulled in that way, they could back into the driveway because those cars that are parked at the top, those will be the only cars there during the day. So there is, uh, again, they could pull into that. It's grassy now, but, um, because of that, that picture, but it, it is has crushed stone on it now uh, to resemble a more of a driveway. Um, and also, too, um, not every parent is picking up at the same time. I mean, throughout the day, you have kids being picked up. Could be three o'clock. You could have it. So, it's, um, in the nine years we were open, the, it was sporadic right when they very get picked sporadic up. when they would come in i mean yes was there maybe two cars at, at one time yeah that did happen um but again there was never more than that it was it was always very sporadic because most we were open from about 7 30 to 5 30. um so parents would get out at four some would get out at Three. five and, and stretch it get there so it was it was never there was never like the whole allotment of children their parents weren't there at the same time so it was never more than two cars there at the same time just just want to reiterate what, mm. what you made earlier that uh, this is actually a turnaround so if, as people are pulling in you, you do a three, three point, point turn. turn backing up into that gravel so that they can then pull out yeah. correct into the road correct. instead of backing into the road mm -hmm. that they're currently doing right they that is correct. have done but in the past so this, there, this provides a safety margin well um, there's it, from where those two cars you see right there you're looking at about two more so you could literally if you put a pack them in you would put two more behind it and two more behind that and you still wouldn't even get the end of the driveway right so there, there, and again, when parents drop off, it's never everybody there. It's at 7:30. It's 7:30, 7:45, and they're, they're, they drop off and they can't wait to get out of the house and leave their kids as quickly as possible. So, but I mean, that that driveway is it doesn't look like it's big come in this picture, but it is very long. Mm -hmm. Yes. See, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by the existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree in municipal, fire, or police protection than the existing uses in the neighborhood. Yeah. As stated, the current daycare has been thoroughly inspected by the state fire marshal and has met uh, all criteria for said inspection. There will be no new substantial impact to the public safety departments. Right, and you said you've already been operating that yeah, there for we were so there for many nine years. years and you never had any problems nope. or anything. No. no. D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supply. There'll be no uh, alterations to any sidewalks or paved curbing that would cause any damage to property. 
E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Uh, as stated, the proposed location will not change in size. The only changes that would be made would be strictly cosmetic, i.e. siding, fresh paint, seal coating uh, of the current driveway, etc. This is keeping uh, the structure within current code laws and regulations. And the house has been recited already uh, two years ago and be roofed at the same time. So that uh, should be hopefully 40 years from now. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Or 30. Oh my gosh, what were we on? I'm really uh, you, that was easy. Thank you. <laughs> F, if located in the shoreland zone as depicted on the town of Scarborough official shoreland zoning map, and I don't think you are not. Yeah, that is not applicable. Uh, the applicant has sufficient right title or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. We are the current property owners. And is this your tax card that you gave us yeah. to show yep. us yes. that? Yes. Perfect. Uh, H, the applicant has the te technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Um, as stated, yes, we have the financial means to comply with any conditions that is given by the Board. I, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. Uh, as stated, yes, we will be compatible with the current uses in the neighborhood. Hours of operation will be 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. at normal business hours and no longer. Time are you opening? Are you operating till seven thirty to five p.m. Yes, sir. Prior year, uh, prior the, to that, we were open till five thirty. We decided that it cuts way into that, your life. That was what was confusing. Huh? Yeah, I heard yeah. five thirty. Yeah. Right? yeah, we 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 kind of changed it up a little bit. It gave us a little more family time. Thank you. Hey, it gets us parents out of work a little bit earlier. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Take care, close soon. Gotta go. Yeah. Okay, so for our home occupation, they have That's performance answer. standards. And so we're going to go through those. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if the board had any questions before we dive into the home occupation standards. I, I got just a quick yes, question. Yes, yeah. Uh, follow up. Here. Mm -hmm. Our previous statements, uh, previously uh, run for nine years, about. Um, at, yeah, it was 2011. We moved in 2011, so maybe eight years. I apologize. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, during that time, did you guys have the max or With 12 no, children? No, the six. Just six. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The what state, this, um, I'm not sure of, but the state has been to our house to approve us. They um, are just waiting for your approval or denial, um, but hopefully the first one, uh, before we actually get the license. Also, the fire marshal has come in and right. approved that space. Okay. So we'll go through the home occupation questions now. One, the occupation of profession shall be carried on wholly within the principal building or within the building's accessory there too. Yes, I'll be carried the Arborview Lane, uh, Scarborough Main. Okay, the home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. Uh, eight, eight, Arborview Lane is primarily a residential dwelling. The business is secondary to the use. Three, no more than one person who is not a resident of the dwelling unit shall be employed in the home occupation. That's correct. Uh, there will be uh, one current resident and only one outside employee since our daughter has now moved out. <laughs> so, so two employees? We're with the owners. And that works with the ratios? That's yes. correct. They're very strict. Yes. <laughs> Four, exterior signage shall be permitted in accordance with the home occupation sign provisions. Do you have a sign? We do. We removed it, and it's still, and I kept it for, you know, I hopefully was hoping that we'd get here again, and, and so we kept it. It's a 12 by 12 sign that will be mounted to the corner of the bottom of the, under the eave of the house. 
right near the door, right the daycare. Yeah, so you see it. We thought maybe mailbox, but now we'd rather have it where it was originally, which was over the house. Mm -hmm. Five, there will be no exterior displays, no exterior storage materials, and no other exterior indication of home occupation or variation from the residential character of the principal building. And this prohibit shall not apply to the storage of lobster traps. Uh, uh, there is a 32 by 32 fence in area um, for outside play located in the furthest part of the backyard with uh, no line, line of sight to the main road. Six, no nuisance shall be generated, including but not necessarily limited to offensive noises, vibration, smoke, dust, odors, heat, or glare. Due to the nature of the business, home daycare, uh, there'll be no nuisance generated, including but not limited to uh, offensive noise, vibration, smoke, dust, or odor. What about those diapers? Uh, <laughs> Those <laughs> yeah. Comes with a fresh scent. <laughs> uh, seven, the traffic generated by such home occupation shall not increase the volume of traffic so as to create a traffic hazard or disturb the residential character of the immediate neighborhood. As stated, there will be no dangerous increase to traffic through the business. We are only open during normal art work hours and drop offs are scattered throughout the morning. Okay. Um, pick up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, eight, in addition to off-street parking provided to meet the normal requirements of dwelling, adequate off-street parking shall be provided for the vehicles of each employee and the vehicle of the maximum number of users or customers the home occupation may attract during peak yeah. operating hours. Yeah. As stated, off-street off parking will be provided for employees and adequate off-street parking space will be provided for parents with a turnaround spot next to the mailbox. Please see the attached picture as you saw. Nine, the home occupation may utilize A, no more than 20% of the dwelling unit floor area provided that for the purposes of this calculation, unfinished basement and attic spaces are not included. Yep. As stated, the total square footage of our dwelling is 2,400 square feet. Our business will only use 382 square feet, which is 15.9% of our floor area under the maximum of 20%. The daycare will be in the basement of the dwelling. So it's just <coughs> that one area. So to the right of the boiler room says the daycare area. Yep. And then there's the bathroom. Yeah. Where did the babies sleep? All, all in the room? Yeah. Fairly big room. Yeah. <coughs> They're very strict challenged. about, about yeah, that are. too. Hmm. Okay. Um, 10, the home occupation may include retail sales subject to the following limitations. Are you doing retail sales? No sales? No, I, don't, I don't think we even answered 10, I apologize. That's, that's, what, that's probably why you yeah, did That's a trick question. Um, they don't apply, 11 is for fishermen, 12 is for motor vehicle pairs. Does the board have any questions in regards to the home occupation qualifications? No, nope. seems pretty straightforward. Yep. Okay, I'm going to open it up to the public. Is there anyone here that would like to speak? Did we get any letters or phone calls? No, we okay. We have the neighbors. I'm close to the public. Um, in regards to the performance standards of home occupation, I don't know if the board feels like we need to go through the criteria. I would like to just do a quick um, Can vote. Can we do just a general vote? General vote. Um, do they feel that the applicant tonight has met all the standards for the home occupation? All in favor? Five. Okay. And then we'll go through the criteria for a special exception. Now the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage emissions or the air or water. Uh, the addition of up to six children five days per week will not create un unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal as the property is served by public sewer. Uh, the children will be cared for the in the sorry will be cared for in the existing home, which is already approved for and operates as a family daycare, and will not create any additional emissions to the air and water. Mr. Hebert, um, they've always they've also demonstrated that their own children, um, other two, will not be in the house during the day, and one has moved out. Uh, so there will be a 
at least as I stated, a slight decrease in um, water consumption there because they indicated that of most of the uh, infants and toddlers and children there will have diapers. Agree. Yeah, I agree. Agree. All in favor of A, B, Matt. B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Uh, the drop-off and pick-off area will be in the existing driveway, which is wide enough for two vehicles at the entrance to the home. Uh, the performance standards for a group daycare home requires that the driveway must be configured so that the vehicles drop off and pick up the children are not required to back into the driveway or into the street in order to <coughs> exit the facility. That was one of the concerns I've had. Um, it looks like they've demonstrated with that in addition there that they have area for someone to turn around. Um, yep, there's an 18 by 18 area at the end of the driveway, and you said you already filled it with rock. With crushed down, yes. Crushed down to help folks avoid backing into the street. I've addressed some of my concerns. Mr. Hebert? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree they've uh, indicated that they provide enough um, uh, enough um, access for vehicles to pull in, back in, and pull out safely. Uh, it may be worthy of note um, as, as you're growing, you're basically doubling your size in this business, maybe letting parents know that if there are a certain number of cars in the driveway mm -hmm. that the parents should just take a loop around the neighborhood Absolutely. until they come back in just to really maintain that, you know, you're not going to have that errant parent who's going to rip onto the front of the yard or something like right. that, dump their kids off. That's, a, that's definitely a reasonable request. Yeah. I agree. You've met the standard. Yeah, I think they've adequately managed the um, flow of traffic. Agreed. All in favor of B being that. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than the existing uses in the neighborhood. The current facility has been inspected and licensed by the state fire marshal and has operated without incident since 2011. Mm -hmm. And based on, and um, Mr. Hebert? I would uh, agree, I'd say the existing safety standards and protocols that they have in place when they were operating back in 2011 um, could carry forward and um, would not create any additional public safety uh, issues. Yeah, this has been met. I agree. Size of the building footprint isn't going to change. I agree. Okay. All in favor of C being met. D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supply. Um, no expansion of the dwelling or the yard has been planned for this activity. So I don't see that happening. Mr. Hebert? No, I agree. I mean, they've added crushed dome, but that doesn't, um, that if anything, it helps sedimentation or erosion. It would not have an adverse effect on water supply. Agree. 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 All in favor of D being met. E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Uh, the addition of six children will take place mostly within the home and within the fenced-in area, and that has been is required to be licensed by the state. And there will be additional vehicles that will deliver and pick up children during the morning and afternoon. Um, but they have testified that, you know, as I think as we kind of know, it won't really have much of an impact or intensity of use. Mr. Hebert? Yep, they've, as you stated, they've indicated they have a 32 by 30 foot foot uh, backyard fence in area, has been state inspected, um, so it will be compatible with, with its existing use that it was already in place. And I agree, and uh, not just compatible, but also fulfilling a, an unmet need in the community. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's going to be compatible with residential use and no different than having a large family in the neighborhood. in favor of E being met. F, if located in the shoreland zone, 
property is not located in the shoreline zone. G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to carry out the proposed use. And the applicant provided their tax record card to indicate and show their ownership. All in favor of G being met. H, the applicant has technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals. The applicant has stated that they have the financial means to comply with any reasonable things that we would impose, and they've already successfully operated a business and are now reopening it. Mr. Hubert? Yep. They've also indicated that they're amenable to any conditions given by the Board, should the Board want to give any conditions. Agreed. And since we have not, then it's not an issue. Right. Agreed. Agreed. All in favor of H being met. I. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to generation of noise and operation of hours. They've presented tonight that they will operate from 7.30 to 5, which is pretty normal business hours. They're coming and going throughout the neighborhood. Mr. Hebert? I agree. It's, it's not, um, if anything, they're having uh, one, one fewer child living there, um, but existing uses in the neighborhood, it's already been there, again, for eight plus years. Um, it's not changing anything or generating undue noise. It's operating between 7.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. when really most people aren't there. They're working, generally. Agreed. Yep, I'll agree with Mr. Hebert. Agreed. All in favor of I being met. Additional performance standards. So there's additional performance standards for the uh, child and adult care facilities, including group daycare homes. And um, we've already covered that the access street, um, the street access is from a uh, street that's classified higher than a local residential street. That was verified by the Scarborough Public Works. Correct. The off-street parking shall be provided for all non-resident employees. So, they're giving you a parking spot. Okay. Maybe. She has a pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's going to be two cars in the yard that are yours. Yeah. Or, no, yours her, or yours. her, and her. Okay. Yeah. I'll be somewhere else. Okay. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> and then, smart. Uh, and you provided the 18 by 18. So, those are the three performance standards that were, in addition to the ones that they would have had to admit for the family. Daycare home. So. Okay. Everybody. So performance standards are met? So those are met. So all in favor of the additional performance standards being met? Yep. Okay. Okay. Ready for the motion? I'll move to approve appeal number 2669 as presented. Second. All in favor? Good luck. Just, just, um, you guys will be filled thank so you. fast. Thank, yeah. <laughs> just a quick question. Um, just to have documentation that we are allowed to have 12, we just need to give that to the state. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that um, something? You'll be receiving a letter um, probably within the next seven days. Okay. And that should say that you're to approve for this, and that should be it. Okay. But if they need anything more, you can contact them. All right. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Okay, now we have a limited reduction of yard side variance of appeal for 14 Ward Street. Mr. Longstaff, I don't know if you... No, if you let, go right. okay. let Joe go ahead and present his uh, thing while I get okay. in the board. Um, I'm okay. going to say a picture is worth a thousand words. Hopefully that we'll get through this and someone else will have a chance to present their case. The red marks the um, existing building uh, envelope without a variance. The green marks it with the uh, variance request. Uh, we're asking this because the lot was sold to us with the idea that there was um, sewer on the lot. Um, we bought it in 2011 and found out last year that it doesn't have sewer. 
that the sewer is 280 feet up the street. Um, we looked at other options. The only option we found feasible and reasonable was to put the septic system, system on. That being said, the setback, the front setback has been reduced. Uh, for, yes, it was reduced. Um, or the, I'm sorry, the setback has been increased to 40 feet as opposed to 30 feet for sewered area. Uh, and that's why we're here tonight, to make it a, a reasonably and practical building envelope. Right now it's 25 by approximately 30 feet for the building envelope. Um, we're asking for the 10-foot variance to allow us to have something that would be more compatible to the neighborhood, more in, in uh, um, conformity to the neighborhood. Um, it's not the ideal situation, but that's the best we can do. So that's why we are here. Uh, we feel as though this will not have a negative impact in the neighborhood because the others are 30 feet from the, um, the 30 foot setback or less. And uh, we would then be in, in, uh, in line with uh, uh, the people in the neighborhood. Um, so with that said, um, I'll open it up to questions. I hope that I, uh, this is a vacant lot now and we have not started construction. Okay, if the board has any questions, I'm gonna go into the criteria. Number one, the existing building or structure on the lot for which the limited reduction of yard size residential is required were erected prior to July 3rd, 1991, or the lot is a vacant, non-conforming lot of record. It is a vacant lot. Yes. Two, the required reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. As stated, um, it's not the ideal situation, but currently at 35 feet wide by 25 feet deep, you would get a very narrow home similar to a, a modular house. Uh, if we went up, it would look like the Great Wall of China. <laughs> so uh, we will definitely be more compatible with this variance. Three, due to the physical features of the law and or location of the existing structures on the law, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. Yes, due to the uh, unique depth of the lot, 80 feet deep, and limiting uh, front yard setback of 40 feet, um, and 15 on the side, um, um, and the added uh, septic system, uh, it would not be practical to build a new house uh, on the lot as it, as it uh, is, stands now. And that being the fact that I said the sewer uh, we have no other alternative, feasible, reasonable, feasible alternative, because the sewer is 280 feet away, and we suspect this ledge in the road. Mm -hmm. so. For the impacts and effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure on the existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirement. As I stated, most of the homes on Ward Street and Libby Street, the one directly behind this lot, um, are mostly 30 feet or less from the, um, from the front setback. Five, the applicant has not commenced construction of the enlargement expansion <coughs> building or structure for which the limited reduction in yard side is required. Right, no construction activity has commenced. Have any questions? I have a quick question. Um, so, when the property was purchased, it was written into the sale agreement that there was public sewer available? The uh, perspectives that we received from the broker stated that it had water stubbed to the lot and sewer stubbed to the lot. As I said, we later found out that that wasn't the case. We do have water, but the sewer wasn't there, it was 280 feet away. Uh, we um, went back and forth with the seller, and she felt uh, adamant that there was a sewer on it. It's not there. We talked with uh, Scarborough Sanitary District. It just isn't there. I guess when was it discovered and determined that 
the sewer uh, wasn't there the last year or the year before that so we just sat we on sat the we sat on we bought it we banked the lot with the idea that we were going to build on it uh, when we had a buyer or when we had a reason to build so that's why we uh, it was two years ago I think when we decided that we wanted to build something we do have a buyer mm -hmm. Uh, now, or I'm sorry, it's a renter. Uh, my son is in the audience tonight, and uh, it would be for his uh, sister and brother-in-law. Gotcha. So you bought it with the understanding that sewer was there, so you just let it go for a while, but then when, when the actual shovel comes to dirt and you check it out, it determines it wasn't there. It was not there. Okay. And we investigated after the fact, but again, we took the brokers at their word that something's there. That's a harsh, that's a hard lesson to learn, unfortunately. Well, again, information is conveyed to the brokers, and sometimes it's not correct, but it's not investigated. Right. Uh, the brokers take the seller uh, at their word, but water was there, and there was a stake marking it, so I don't think there was any reason for them to dispute it. Right. But we learned a lesson that when they tell us something's there, we're going to make sure that it's there. Yeah, right. always did, did they have it on documentation that you know it is there, or like at least there in their? Well, it's an information that was provided to right. us, written information. Understood. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? No. Hmm? No. Open it to the public. I don't know if there's anyone here that would like to speak tonight. Do we get any emails? We did no. Letters. I had a discussion with one neighbor, but he did not issue anything in writing, and he just had some questions. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. There we go. Most of the neighbors are aware of what we are doing, and they do not seem to have any objections. Really? They didn't okay. express anything negatively to us. Okay. So I'll close the public hearing, and then the board's going to go through their criteria. Okay, the existing building or structure on the lot for which the limited reduction of yard size is required was erected prior to July 3rd, 1991, or the lot is a vacant, non-conforming lot of record. The lot is a non-conforming lot of record. It has never had a structure on it. Okay, I've referred to it. Yeah, I have nothing to add to this. Pretty, pretty simple and direct. It's a vacant yeah, lot. Just show a hand. Call the question. <laughs> All in favor of yeah. one being met. Two, the re requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. As we've heard tonight, the lot is 80 feet deep with 40 foot front yard and 15 foot rear yard and would accommodate a building that is 25 foot wide. And the applicant is proposing a structure that is approximately 26 feet wide and 31 foot long. And they are looking simply to build a home on their lot, just like all the other homes on the road. Mr. Hebert. I agree. Um, their, their request, I mean, their request is their only path to actually enjoy the property uh, in the same manner of other properties in the area, as that was the intent when they purchased the property and they were uh, falsely led to believe that uh, there were no issues there. I agree. So I, I feel like probably a little bit more investigation probably would have been helpful to you ahead of time, but at the same time, I, I, I think this is kind of goes without saying, you, you can't build anything on this without going ahead and getting the variance. I agree. They're all in favor of two being met. Three, due to the physical features of the lot and or location of the existing structures on the lot, it would be not be practical to construct the proposing expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. The majority of the lots in the Ward Street neighborhood are deeper than 80 feet, and they have public sewer service, and because it's being serviced by public sewer, they have a front yard setback of 30 feet instead of 40. Mr. Heber. Um, again, the, the, f the physical features of the lot, because they have to have um, the septic in there, this is really their only avenue where they can construct this proposed expansion or this structure. 
Agreed. Yeah, I think with the building envelope, you have just way too narrow a house to be able to be practical. So, absolutely. Agreed. The site constraints. Madam Chair. Yes. Joe, did they poke around and see if there was any areas where the garage is located so that the septic system could be moved to one end of the lot? I assume they must have and hit ledge. They or poked around for, for a suitable uh, septic uh, so design. Right in the middle that, of the lot that's really where built. it was. There's ledge where the garage is. Yep. We don't know whether the garage can be built because the outcropping yep. is okay. probably closer. But with the variance, we have more of an opportunity to find a, a suitable spot. Right. But that's what uh, Albert Frick came up with. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to verify that, okay, that there was other locations on the lot that were yeah. looked at, but weren't yeah. suitable. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of three being met. Four, the impacts and effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure on the existing uses in the neighborhood will not create, will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirements. You know, many of the dwellings on Ward Street have a front yard setback less than 40 feet and several are less than 30 feet. Uh, the proposed side yard setbacks adjacent to lots that contain dwellings would meet or exceed the minimum setback distance of 15 feet. Mr. Heber? All right, they're going to have a 30 foot front setback reduction, which is. Um, they're also not. Um, they're building a modest home and not seeking to build a mansion here, we'll say. Yes, and it's something that'll blend in with the rest of the neighborhood. Agreed. Yeah, every, uh, all of the other houses that I've seen you build have been very practical and very, uh, you know, appropriate. So I, I have no, con no concerns at all about this. All in favor of four being met. <clears throat> Five, the applicant has not commenced construction. Uh, they have applied for a building permit. That was denied, and here you are tonight. You have not started construction. This is the building permit that was denied. There we go. <laughs> there we go. He was so mad he wouldn't even pick it up. <laughs> Mr. Heber? Yeah, I don't think there's anything to add. The town has proven that construction has not been commenced. Agreed. 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 Okay, all in favor of five being met. I'll move to approve appeal number 2670 as presented. I'll second. All in favor? Thank you. Good luck. Good doing one more. I'm game for whatever our, you guys want. Our really says that we don't take applications up after 10:30. Yeah. You know, I mean, we have you guys are volunteers. I'm asking you if you. I, I feel like. Uh, so here's my position on it. I'm fine with it. Do we have to worry about the gentleman that's in the booth recording us or anything else too? Yeah, well, they would have been gone about two hours ago. <laughs> I mean, whatever, whatever we have to, I'm, I'm fine with whatever everybody else work, says is okay. Since I'm an accessory, may I bring you? Or mm -hmm. if one of us leaves, that's everybody. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Is the rest of the board okay? Moving on for one more? I'd like to do that. Can you? Yeah, you can. Yes. Mr. Let's go. All right. Thank All right. Yes. Yeah. I know. We appreciate. Okay. Well, throw some powder here. If you want, you'll be first you on the agenda first. next month. Did they already leave? I think she did. No, we're all we're all okay. we're all together. Yeah, yes. I think she left already. Okay, so eight C Rose Lane. Eight C Rose Lane. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being so patient. Yes, um, my name is Linda Braley. I work. Uh, I'm Braley Designs, and I'm helping the clients Joni and Bill, um, and their brother George, who um, own the property and want to make uh, an expansion. The, the uh, application is for a limited reduction of yard size uh, to do an addition in the back. Um, the site plan, which I think is the first sheet of the series, um, 
shows the, the setbacks with the, the existing building is non-conforming and with the